Hello and welcome to 2022 National Coding Symposium. We're excited to have you all joining us again today. If you're joining us for the first time today, um, welcome. Again, you all are joining us for the 2022 National Coding Symposium. I'm going to go ahead, oh, let, while we're getting settled, let's go ahead and get this taken care of right away. Um, if you're looking for ACVREP credit for today, our opening code word is going to be hyper. H-Y-P-E-R, hyper. We'll be dropping that in the chat as well. Again, welcome to the 2022 National Coding Symposium. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Adrian Armandi. Thank you, Adrian. Of course. Thank you, Jeff. Um, happy to have everybody here joining us. I know people are filtering in now. Uh, for those of you who have already joined in, we do have a slight shift to our keynote speaker this morning. Uh, our keynote was um, Leonie, Leonie was unable to make it this morning. Um, and so Greg Stilson of APH will be joining us as our keynote. Um, Ann Durham will be joining us shortly to, uh, to introduce Greg. Uh, yesterday went really, really well. We will get those recordings up to the APH YouTube channel as soon as we are able once this week is complete. Um, give, give it a little bit of time to get things patched up and onto the YouTube channel, but you'll have it. All of the resources yesterday that were covered with Code Jumper and other resources referenced are on the Coding Symposium symposium website underneath resources. Um, don't forget if you are a student or a teacher of a student to check out the awards link on the Coding Symposium website. Um, the awards link has the award opportunity. We have six different $3,000 donations from APH, Vespero, and Humanware. So each of those uh, companies is donating a single piece of hardware or um, equipment to an award winner. To become an award winner, you have to fill out the form and be an attendee. So um, make sure that you uh, are filling out the form each day or each time that you um, come to the coding symposium. Double check in one thing real fast about our, if somebody from APH could reach out to Ann um, to make sure we have it. And if not, we'll migrate on in a couple of minutes. The other thing that's interesting on our website uh, that is definitely worth taking a look at is the STEM scholarships. Uh, if you are a high school senior planning to attend college and you're interested in any STEM subject, you're going to be eligible to apply to a uh, scholarship from, uh, it's called the Peter Papano APH STEM Scholarship. It's a fantastic opportunity that can carry through your college years um, and give you money to go through, um, go through your undergrad, which is a very exciting moment. I'm pumped today about HTML and this focus that we're going to do um, on learning how to web design as an element of learning coding. I'm quite excited about the sessions we have coming up as they're going to not only uh, continue to introduce coding, um, but additionally help screen reader users beef up their navigation commands, which is always exciting. All right, Ms. Ann Durham has joined us. Um, and once Anne gets set up and situated and gets her camera on, I will pass it over to her so she can introduce our keynote speaker, Greg Stilson. I am happy to do that. It will not let me start my video, however. We need to promote you somehow. Oh, that sounds exciting. She no. is promoted to panelist. Zoom has had issues this week. They did an update this week, and they've not been our friend. What if she's promoted to co-host? It says the host has stopped it. So whoever the host is, is stopping my video. <laughs> so we can go ahead and start or we can try try to fix that, whatever you all want to do. Oh, now you're going in. Ta -da. Beautiful. All okay. right. All right, fantastic. All right, so we're ready to do the introduction then, right? All yes. right. Thank you so much for waiting. It's always fun when you have a have technology problems at, for a, a technology conference. So, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Durham, and I am the Vice President and Chief Officer of Innovation and Strategy at the American Printing House for the Blind. And it is my great pleasure to introduce you today to my colleague, friend, and often my partner in crime, Greg Stilson. 
Greg has been working in blind and low vision technology for more than 15 years. And I first met Greg when he was working with Humanware, where he led the development of such devices that you may know, uh, like the Braille Note Touch, the Trekker Breeze, and the Brilliant Braille devices and more. And we continued our collaboration when he moved on to work with Ira, leading the development of the Ira app and the Smart Glasses platform, creating on-demand visual information. Now, Greg is not a coder, but he understands coders in a very unique way. You can say he knows enough about coding to either be dangerous or magical, depending on your perspective. When my role at APH began to include product development, which encompasses a lot of very ambitious technology goals, I knew we needed someone with Greg's skills, someone who understood the unique language of coders. Now, not just coding language per se, but the way that coders think, the way they analyze, break down tasks, solve problems, and the way they trailblaze. Someone who could communicate the needs of coders to people who think very differently than they do. People who are in marketing, sales, customer service, finance, and product development. And most importantly, we needed someone who could effectively communicate the needs of our customers to the coders. Now that is a rare and valuable skill, especially in our field. So I was very pleased when Greg agreed to come to APH to head our new global innovation division. Now, since then, he has been a driving force in bringing products like Mantis, Chameleon, and Juno to market, just to name a few. And there are many, many other exciting and innovative products on the way just in his short few years here. But I'm not going to spoil those surprises. Just please welcome today's keynote speaker, Greg Stilson. Hey, thanks so much, Anne. And I hope everybody's having a great day. I am coming to you from my basement here in Madison, Wisconsin, where we are finally finally seeing some spring slash summer weather. Uh, we're looking at about 78 degrees here, which in Wisconsin is like, it's that first really warm weekend where, or week where you're like, everybody's got shorts on and just everybody's really happy because we've been stuck inside for, <laughs> for five and a half months or so. Um, so I'm so happy to be here. Um, as Ann mentioned, I, you know, I, I think the theme of my, my talk today is primarily around coding is not just for coders. Um, a little bit about sort of my journey to where I am today. I'm a, a blind person myself, um, but when I was younger, I was your stereotypical rebellious low vision kid. Um, so I was born with Leber's congenital amaurosis, LCA, and I had quite a bit of vision when I was a kid. Um, I didn't want to, you know, I was I was very lucky to have some some uh, incredible teachers of the visually impaired and some very driven uh, parents who were phenomenal advocates for me. And so I, I was taught a lot of blindness skills at a very young age. Um, even though I had a significant amount of vision, I learned Braille by the time I was five years old and um, learned to use a, a white cane to, to navigate, um, even though I did not want to at all. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, was, I was your typical low vision kid. If I could ever use my vision uh, to do any task, I was going to, to use my vision and not use any of those quote unquote blindness things. Um, <clears throat> as time progressed, I recognized that there's certain things that my vision just was, was not effective at doing. Um, I was lucky enough to have a very tech driven father. My dad's an engineer um, and among my you know, our, our group of friends and family when I was younger, we were lucky enough to have um, a, a personal computer. This is back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and that really started me on my journey of technology. Um, my dad was uh, very much an advocate of me as a, a low vision slash blind kid starting to uh, really tinker with technology. And the first thing that he had me do, you know, I, I played with a lot of electronics kits when I was a kid and things like that. But um, as time progressed, he had me start to build my own computer. Um, and that's something that I did all the way through college as I, I was never, I looked down on the people that bought computers, right? I would build my own computer. Um, and that was back in the day when building computers, um, there's a lot of things that, that could go wrong and a lot of troubleshooting that was, was necessary, right? And when I look at back on my sort of journey of technology, the troubleshooting of building my own computer tower, um, uh, making sure that the BIOS worked and that whenever we received RAM or memory errors and things like that, that I was able to troubleshoot all of that. 
And and that I would say is really a, a vital skill that that started um, started me off on this technology journey is the ability to troubleshoot, come up with unique ways of working around challenges and things like that. But the the reality is as time progressed is I, I was super excited about getting into technology and getting into coding and things like that. And I remember in high school, I took uh, my first coding class, Visual Basic. And like I said, I was that rebellious low vision kid. I insisted on coding just using my vision. And so I'm sitting there with my nose up on top of the screen and uh, trying to, to read the various lines of code with my eyes, which I, you know, one of the, the parts of my vision that was quickly deteriorating was I had tunnel vision. That, that tunnel was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So being able to track where there were syntax errors or where there's, you know, the different colors and things like that, right? Like that, that was not an effective use of my, my, uh, my vision at all. And I noticed that as time progressed, I was a slower and slower and slower coder um, compared to my friends. Um, and this was incredibly frustrating. And I, I attributed it to the fact that I was just a bad coder. Well, little did I recognize that it wasn't because I was a bad coder. I mean, now I recognize that I am not a great coder. But uh, back then, I was way behind because I was not properly using the tools at my, at my, um, at my disposal there. Um, it wasn't until really web browsing got me interested in screen readers, being able to, to navigate the World Wide Web and have all this information at my fingertips that I found out that my vision was not an effective way of doing that. So I started to learn screen readers um, and become you know, really an, uh, an expert screen reader user. And in college, I, got a, I, I majored in computer science, at, um, at least at the start, right? And so... Um, I started to code again, and I was I, I retook Visual Basic because I was not very good at it. Um, I retook Visual Base Visual Basic in college, and I found that it was a much much easier experience. Not because I took it the second time, but because I was coding with a screen reader. I wasn't trying to look at the screen and track visually where all of the the errors were or where things were were not going correctly. I was using the tools uh, at my disposal there. I was using a screen reader to actually be able to understand um, what was what was happening. And I think that the, the first sort of pillar of this conversation or this talk is that even before you, you start to want to become a, a coder or even before you start those aspirations, make sure that you've mastered those foundational tools. Because I can tell you, I didn't. I didn't master that, those foundational tools. And I found that it was an extremely frustrating experience. Um, and there was a number of things that went through my head when I was struggling like that, right? Like the, the first thing was, number one, am I, am I just a bad coder? Number two, are blind people or people who have low vision, are they just not cut out to be coders? Um, it wasn't until I figured out that there's tools that, that are at your disposal that, that allow you to succeed at this, that make you a heck of a lot more efficient um, using different commands and things like that. So um, that's, that's the first piece. The second piece is... As I progressed in college, I, I learned that uh, I, my brain was just not wired the same way that my friends who were successful in coding, right? Like I, I, I noticed that when they completed a, uh, a project, for example, they, they had this extreme sense of pride and they were so excited about what they had built. They had come up with these really cool programs and, and were really successful. And I remember when I completed projects, I was like, Phew, thank God that's done. Uh, I, I did not have that same sense of pride. I was happy to get it over with at that point. And I recognized that I was not in enjoying coding, right? Like I, it, was, it was a skill that I, had, I was building. Uh, it was always a challenge. Um, it was something that just seemed to come a lot easier to to my friends and things like that. And they also had this massive sense, sense of accomplishment, right? And I, I, to be honest with you, I felt like I was, I was failing at my major. Um, and it wasn't until I talked to a, a, a couple of professors and things like that that made me realize that you know, people, students change their majors all the time. And so uh, I ended up changing my major to uh, where we always, my, my, my cohort there that, that uh, was in that major. I changed to network administration and business management. 
um, we always joke that that's where the coding rejects always went. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, uh, I was in a situation where um, I had learned the, the, the skills. I learned how to speak the language of coding. I learned how to solve problems um, using code. Most importantly, I learned generally how, um, how coders thought. But I learned the most important lesson, in, in my view, is that I didn't enjoy coding, and I was not cut out to be a coder. Um, it wasn't until I started to work in technical support and training that I realized I had this real passion for um, the customer, the user, uh, and, and understanding how to troubleshoot problems, but most importantly, understand where those roots of the problems came from. Um, and that's really where I started developing my, my affinity for product management. And um, as, as, I, as I progressed in, in that career, I started product, I was offered a, a position at, at Humanware for a uh, product manager of their Braille products in 2010. And as time progressed, I recognized that I sort of served this role of a liaison between the, the customer, the user, and the software engineers. And part of that is that I was able to speak the language of the, the, the software engineers. Um, I was able to brainstorm with them, uh, be able to communicate the challenges that the customers were having, but at the same time, I was also able to speak to the customers in a way that they were under, able to understand. And, and it was um, the development of those skills and honing those skills, most importantly, to, to create sort of these, these scopes of work that were achievable for the engineers that were also solving the problems that the customers were looking to, to solve or to have, have solved. Um, the, the, the role of a product manager, is, is, as I see it, is always to be focused on the user. Um, but it's also sort of this, this role of making sure that you're, you're also keeping the business goals in mind as well, right? And so making sure that you're, you're kind of balanced, walking this tightrope of making sure that the users are getting what they need, um, which is then fueling your business and being able to continue to, to come up with innovative products in the future. Um, but then taking those goals to the software engineers and saying, okay, we need to prioritize X, Y, and Z. How are we gonna solve these problems? And I am a firm believer um, that if somebody has come before you that have solved these problems, how can we work together and create partnerships with those organizations or those people who've created these, these let's say services or things like that? Is there an API that allows us to, to integrate with, with X, Y, Z service? So my, my point being here is that, um, you know, learning coding taught me a, a, a number of, of skills. The most important skill is that my lane or where, where I want to be in my career is not a programmer. Um, I truly did not enjoy that. Um, but I gained so many valuable skills that have led me to a career in product management um, that, that really have opened this up in a way that I can communicate to both sides of the house. And I always tell people, um, and I, one of the things that I mentioned to, you know, to, to my team of, of product managers and any product manager that I talk to is your job is not to develop the how. How is this problem going to be solved? Leave that to the coders who are much smarter than you in that regard. I, I do not want to develop the how. I can help brainstorm the how and I can start communicating the user needs um, that can hopefully influence the how. But your, your job is to develop the what needs to be solved and why it needs to be solved. Let them develop the how, and then you guys work together on the win. So really, you know, to, to, to sum this up or to wrap this up, um, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize that, you know, those foundational skills of, of learning screen reading, learning typing, those are all things that have to come before you learn coding. You will find that coding is an extremely frustrating experience if you haven't mastered those foundational thing, things first. The second is it's okay if you don't enjoy coding. I know that maybe you have all these, these some of you may have these visions of my, my job is going to be a computer programmer. And then you get into it and you're like, oh man, maybe I don't enjoy this as much as I thought to. I did. That's okay. There are a number of other roles in technology that are not programming related. But your knowledge of coding and the knowledge that you've, you've obtained from that 
um, will serve you well on that journey. And, and so make sure that you do learn the art of coding. Um, that is something that, that is, is crucial if you want to be in technology and you want to be working with software engineers. Being able to speak that language is crucial. Um, but like I said, you know, there, there are careers out there where you are not coding every single day, but you're still influencing the development of technology. So, um, so with that, I want to want to thank you. I want to thank uh, you for your attention and for taking the time out of your day uh, to listen to this conversation and, and this talk. Um, and keep keep going with the with the aspirations that you have with regard to coding or technology. And know that there are tremendous amounts of resources out there. You all, if, if you're a blind student or you're a young person trying to learn coding or trying to get into the, the, the world of technology, I can tell you that today there are there it has it has never been a better time for a blind person to get into technology. The amount of resources, but most importantly, then the the number of folks that you're gonna hear from here at this coding symposium and, and throughout the world, there are so many people who have come before you who are blind programmers or blind coders who have gone into technology or, or product managers like myself who have done this before. You don't, have to, you don't have to create this from scratch. There are people who, who have developed these skills and who have tips and tricks that you can learn from. So um, as, I, as I've done, you know, start speaking to um, uh, blind professionals who have done this before. Find a person in your area who, uh, or, or in your social network who has, has done these tasks and maybe have some, some really good tips and tricks or advice that you can learn from. So keep going with your aspirations and enjoy the rest of the coding symposium. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Greg. Thank you very much. Um, absolutely inspired by this thought that it's the technology itself that's important that coding will back up and there are so many avenues uh, that learning technology and beefing up your technology skills can take you down. Um, that is uh, spot on and precisely why we are running this National Coding Symposium. We know that introducing coding to students uh, and young adults and, and grown adults um, is a way to, to get better at your total understanding of technology in and of itself and um, can lead you down a myriad of career paths. Very much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. We, um, I, I feel like Greg just pitched the whole, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of APH, the whole Connect Center with this idea of connecting to other people in, in your area and in your field of interest. Um, if you went to the National Coding Symposium website, you landed on the APH Connect Center website, uh, an opportunity to look at careers and um, connect with, with the world of blindness and to find avenues to succeed um, yourselves in, in ways that um, are, you know, it can be difficult to find connections and the APH Connect Center is there to help. We are going to transition to our first panel. Um, our first panel today is a uh, panel and Q&A on web design and accessibility with HTML and CSS. Um, our panel moderator is Ken Perry. Um, Ken Perry works at APH. Um, he's been working in access technology for over 30 years. Uh, I've been fortunate to get to know Ken better through this coding symposium the last couple of years. Uh, he is another truly inspirational person to get to know. He's opinionated and fun. Um, he is a hardcore uh, advocate of accessibility and making sure that things uh, work for blind and low vision users both. He's worked on a couple great projects that I'm sure all of you in our audience have heard of one or two of, from the Orbit Reader to the Orion TI-84 Plus to the Snap Circuit set that APH currently has um, as part of their uh, Road to Code uh, and other coding tools. Um, additionally, he's, he's worked on even more than that, um, but even cooler, I ran into Ken with another project we were working on last year. He does a tabletop role-playing game. I, I'm calling it the wrong thing, Ken, uh, but he has an online multi-dungeon, ah, some online version of a, of a tabletop role-playing game called Valhalla, um, which is exciting. Ken's been doing this coding for a long time, and Ken, uh, I know that Speaking on behalf of all of us, I very much appreciate that you are here to moderate this next panel. And I'm excited for you to encourage these kids to look at web design as a way to get into coding themselves. Uh oh. You will want to unmute Ken. He did. 
Hello? Now can you hear me? Nope, now we can hear you, Ken. Perfect. So, new earphones, because I didn't want to look like too much of a space cadet. This is pretty good. But I guess opinionated is a really nice way to say I have a big mouth and I get right in there with everybody. But thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to let these two guys, uh, we, we're going to have three panelists, but it looks like we're whittled down to two because we have a crisis on one of the panelists. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself. I'm going to start out with Jason. You want to go first and give your introduction? Sure. Can you all hear me okay? Perfectly. Awesome. Uh, fantastic to be here. Boy, I was, uh, just caught the tail end uh, of Craig's uh, discussion as a program manager, which is uh, what I've done for most of my life. So that was inspiring. And uh, plus one is all I could say to that. Um, I, uh, I uh, you know, kind of started my career at Microsoft. Uh, and um, yeah, similar to that, I, I um, you know, was uh, computer engineering uh, as I kind of uh, went to school and college. And I did okay with coding. And I'll never forget, I was doing interviews uh, for different companies. And the last interview I did with Microsoft, the, uh, the person said, well, you did all right uh, in the coding interview, but you sound more like a program manager. And uh, I didn't know what that meant. Uh, and so uh, we had started actually talking about, uh, he was a developer on msn.com and we were talking about the accessibility of it. I was talking about some of the accessibility problems I was having uh, because of my visual impairment. Uh, and uh, he was really excited about fixing those issues. He said, well, you, you've identified issues, help me prioritize my problems. That's kind of what a PM does. So he sent me some information and um, I you know, uh, learned about the PM role uh, went out to Microsoft and figured, oh, like I'll go, I'll go out on Microsoft's time, and uh, you know, uh, go for a trip out in Seattle, uh, and interviewed uh, with the accessibility team there, and and just enjoyed the experience so much. And the end of the day, they were like, oh, like come join us, uh, and really appreciated it. So I, um, you know, got to join Microsoft as a program manager. I've worked on accessibility at Microsoft and Windows, working on low vision tools, which is near and dear to my heart uh, as someone with. Uh, low vision. Um, I have about 2,100 in my left eye and 2,200 in my right eye. Uh, that's with correction. Um, and I have light sensitivity as well. So I use magnification, large fonts, um, lots of different things. And the fact that I got to work uh, at Microsoft on those was uh, fantastic. Uh, in addition to working on accessibility, uh, I had uh, great mentors that said also push yourself to learn new areas uh, of technology. So I got to work on uh, Windows Phone, specifically on the keyboards. Uh, where I got exposed to machine learning, uh, where we use machine learning to make typing easier. I uh, got to work on Microsoft Band, which was a, a very short-lived uh, compete to something like Apple Watch, uh, where I focused on health and fitness. I uh, really enjoyed that space so much that I went and did a startup uh, for a year to work on health and fitness. Uh, I won't talk too much about it. I will just say that the startup, we literally sent electrical signals to shock uh, muscles. So you put on a suit, uh, and, and we sent electrical signals as you worked out, which was uh, amazing technology. Uh, and, and if you're interested to learn more about that, uh, happy to talk about it. Um, and then um, ultimately went back to Microsoft for a couple more years after the startup to work on accessibility again. Uh, and then most recently had the opportunity to work at Apple. So that's what I'm doing now um, up here in Seattle. There's a team that focuses on machine learning. Uh, and I've always respected Apple as a company for their technology. Uh, and really wanted to understand how they build their software, build their hardware. Uh, and so I got the opportunity to work on their machine learning platform and technology team, uh, which I've done for two years. So uh, I got to learn about Apple and I've gotten to learn about machine learning a lot more. Uh, and that's been a blast. So uh, excited to be here and answer questions and, and talk with you all. Thank you. Perfect. That, that sounds like you're going to have some good answers for us. Uh, Michael, you want to go next? I think it's Michael, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm Michael Forzano. Um, I, in, in terms of, uh, forget, sorry about that, that interruption. Uh, yeah, so in terms of my journey into coding, um, actually rolled into this panel, how I kind of got into it was building websites. Um, you know, I, I always say that I started out wanting to build games, which is totally true. Um, but, you know, I didn't know how to build games. So I figured why not make a website? Um, where I could say the games were coming soon. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of how I first got into it. Then I, um, you know, at that time, um, there were not a lot of resources, uh, you know, for blind coders or even, you know, sighted coders, like even in my 
you know, school, I didn't have a computer science class or anything like that. Um, there just wasn't a lot. So, you know, I, I used to play a lot of games, uh, you know, games that were developed by, you know, other blind folks. And, you know, I wanted, you know, I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to develop games, you know, even just as a hobby. Um, and, you know, so eventually I did connect with uh, some other blind people who were developing games and kind of was able to help out with a few small projects. This is when I was in high school. Um, you know, so I started doing that, um, you know, learned some basic coding, like I was doing using Visual Basic 6 at the time. Um, you know, I did some even uh, kind of rudimentary online games, uh, deterrent based stuff. Um, and, you know, at that point, I, I knew I really liked it. Um, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in terms of, uh, you know, as I was applying to colleges, what I wanted to major in. Um, I was kind of considering between computer science and law, obviously two totally different things. Um, Ultimately, I figured, well, why not major in computer science? Because I was told that uh, it was easier to get in as a computer science major from the beginning rather than switching in later at some schools, uh, because uh, some schools have separate engineering schools, uh, and it's a little bit harder to, I guess, uh, transfer in later on. Uh, so I said, well, I'll apply for computer science major, see how it goes. I know it's something that I like and I'm somewhat good at. Uh, so I did that. Um, you know, it, it was nice because I kind of had a bit of a head start when I went into college. I had already done some coding. Um, I was just learning different languages, learning Java, learning C++. Um, and it was great. You know, I, I felt uh, definitely validated. It was something that I did like and, and wanted to do. Um, so around uh, junior year of college, I you know, started to think, well, I should probably look for an internship for the summer. I uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do, um, you know, I knew the big tech companies were out there like Amazon, for example, and Facebook. I didn't really think I was good enough for those um, because I well, just wasn't that confident at the time. Uh, I think the first interview I did was with Facebook uh, since I had a former professor who had ended up going to work for Facebook um, and didn't do very well on that. Um, and at that point, a friend suggested, well, why not apply to Amazon? So I said, sure, might as well. Um, applied. They were doing interviews on campus in person at the time. Uh, you know, I kind of just walked in there, um, said, hey, I'm, I'm blind. Would it be okay if I, um, because at the time, a lot of interviews were done on a whiteboard, you know, where you would, you would write code on a whiteboard, um, which obviously I was totally blind. I used a screen reader. You know, that's not going to work for me. Um, so you know, I said, can I just write the code on my laptop and then send it to you? And they said, no problem. Uh, you know, I hadn't really notified them of anything, um, you know, in advance, uh, but it was fine. I uh, was able to, I thought I did pretty well, you know, wasn't totally sure. Um, they were solving the questions. I was a 90 minute interview, I think. Um, and then about a week later, I uh, heard that I had been accepted for an internship out in Seattle. So I flew out to Seattle for the summer, worked on uh, the textbook rentals team, which at the time hadn't even been launched yet. So it was a really cool chance to work on. I was working on a service that sent out the email reminders to uh, students to, you know, hey, it's time to return your textbook. Um, you know, and that was going to be used later in the semester, uh, you know, for the first launch of, of textbook, Amazon textbook. So, you know, really cool to work on uh, such an impactful project, uh, you know, so early on in my career. Um, and I think one of the things I remember about that internship is the, uh, you know, my, my manager, um, you know, I kind of, he didn't really know in advance that I was blind because uh, it didn't get, you know, communicated. I didn't know who my manager was until a few days before. Um, so, and this is not to say that a blind person can't do front end development, but, um, you know, he thought like, hey, you know, I was going to have you on a front end project, um, but, you know, uh, there's this back end project that I feel like would be easier for you. Um, so, you know, why don't you do that? Um, and, you know, as it turned out, um, you know, I've mainly been a back end developer. I do do some front end here and there. Um, but, you know, back end is what I'm more interested in. And, uh, you know, I guess doing web development where it's really important to understand how things look, uh, you know, dealing with CSS and uh, dealing with colors and, you know, it's doable. I've heard of blind people doing it, certainly. Um, but for me, it was something that I wasn't super interested in. So uh, it worked out in that sense. Um, so at the end of my internship, I I did find out even before I left Seattle that I had a, a full-time, I had received a full-time offer to come back. Um, so, so I did. I've now been at Amazon for about nine years. Um, I was living in Seattle for the first seven years or so. Um, 
came back and worked on the Amazon trading program, uh, which allows you to trade in your old, uh, you know, electronics, video games, Kindles uh, for, for gift cards. You can, you know, buy something else or a new version or whatever it may be. I uh, worked on that for about three years. Uh, and then as the accessibility team was growing, uh, I ended up switching over there, uh, which I kind of had mixed feelings about. I wasn't sure that I wanted to work on accessibility uh, you know, because it can be hard um, just given that, you know, as a blind person, I have to deal with accessibility issues, you know, on a daily basis. Like, did, was that something I really wanted to work on? You know, I wasn't sure, um, but I was kind of looking for a change at that point. Um, you know, I decided to give that a try. Um, and since then, I've been working on our um, automated accessibility testing tool, which is used all across the company uh, to scan web pages for accessibility, checks for things like uh, color contrast, whether images have alt text, whether all the four moments are labeled, um, and then you know gives teams a report of what their accessibility uh, defects are. And it looks as though that maybe your microphone went out again. Sorry, I turned it off because of the, the tornado sirens testing. You guys probably heard that if you're in Louisville. Um, sorry, I'm back on now. <laughs> uh, so I, I wanted to start out since there's a lot of new people on uh, as participants. I wanted to ask uh, kind of each of you, um, let's see. If you if you were starting out today um, in an HTML style, like if you wanted to do HTML stuff, um, what would you want to know to begin with? Like, what kind of tools do you need? What uh, would you? What screen readers? Uh, what kind of equipment would you want to use? So, uh, Mike, you want to give that a shot first? Sure. Um, so. You know, I use the NVDA screen reader um, on Windows. Uh, it's a free open source screen reader uh, for those who are familiar. Um, you know, JAWS is, of course, also a good option. Um, you know, so very widely used. And then, uh, you know, VoiceOver if you're on the Mac, uh, the built in screen reader. Uh, for HTML, I, I usually just use a plain text editor. So uh, on Windows, I like Notepad. Uh, it's basically uh, a similar to Notepad, but optimized for coding. So you can have, you know, multiple different tabs. Uh, you have multiple different, different files open at the same time, uh, and you're able to easily switch between them. Um, it'll do things like auto indentation. Um, there's some plugins. There's a plugin that I use, for example, for it um, that allows you to kind of fix the indentation for the whole file, um, you know, at the end, like, so you don't have to worry about indentation as you're coding. Um, but you know, for sighted folks, the indentation is uh, super important because it makes the code easier to you or to read uh, visually. Um, so, you know, it's something that um, I found as I transitioned from just kind of coding on my own or coding with other blind people, and then going into you know an actual career. Like I did have to pay attention to uh, formatting. So it's nice when the tools just do it for you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, really for HTML, you don't need a whole lot uh, in terms of an ID when I'm coding in Java or JavaScript. I'm usually using Visual Studio Code, uh, you know, which has a lot more functionality um, like autocomplete and, um, you know, automatically importing, uh, you know, other Java classes and so on. Okay. Jason? Yeah, I think it was great. It was, uh, the the Nada Notepad, Notepad++ is great. Um, I remember that now I'm going to like feel like I'm showing my age a bit. I, I got into um, HTML coding using front page uh, back in the day, uh, which was which was terrible. Uh, one, it was terrible for accessibility. It added so much extra goo uh, to the web pages. Uh, it really it, it really wasn't very good. Um, however, what I'll say is with those I don't even know if we use this term anymore. WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Uh, editors, uh, it's kind of a nice way to get started. So like there are other uh, things like WordPress, there's lots of these kind of places uh, and apps and, and things that can help you get started on creating content. Um, and you you naturally start to go, oh, I want to make it look a little different. Um, and, and those tools will let you start to edit uh, more like the raw HTML. Um, and so that's kind of how I got into to really coding, um, was, was using kind of the, the, the tools 
uh, that didn't have, you know, me writing just in a blank screen. Uh, but I started editing, you know, uh, front page was having some issues. So I went into the back end and, you know, uh, started editing the code. Uh, and then, um, you know, that's how I got into it. And I, I think uh, the tools have gotten a lot better uh, for content and things. Uh, and so that's a nice way to get to get started is to just use these tools that help you write content. Um, and then you can start to do specific changes um, uh, on those, you know, kind of through the, the editor. Um, and then, yeah, I think Visual Studio is, is great. There's some free versions, um, you know, Xcode on, on, on Mac, um, you know, um, for, for me with low vision, um, I've definitely seen uh, lots of improvements, especially by um, kind of plugging into uh, the dark mode, uh, which was a lifesaver. I feel like when I was doing this to begin with, uh, I could only do short amounts of time because I was just staring at the, the white screen. It really hurt my eyes. But uh, most of the editors now have a dark mode uh, and they have ways in the settings to make the, the text a lot larger as well, which is great. And then they follow follow the magnifier as well. Again, I, if I think about all the different um, editors that I've used, they do a good job following uh, magnification. So good, good support on the, the tool side there. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like the answer is going to be different for both of you on this one because one's low vision, one's uh, blind, I guess. Um, do you guys find, and and I guess either one could pick it up first, but do you guys find that um, web editing tools are accessible? And if not, uh, do you know of some web ed, uh, tools? So like if you wanted to edit HTML online and learn HTML online, things like W3C schools, is there things like that that you guys find is accessible and usable? I have a lot of experience with those. I think part of it is that I'm kind of old school in that way. And I like to just be down in the code. And, uh, you know, like when I'm doing web development, I will just, uh, you know, for example, um, I don't think I mentioned, uh, I don't think I mentioned um, that I am the co-founder of RS Games, uh, which I started with when I was in college, which is a uh, online uh, board and card game platform uh, for blind people, it's free. It's at rsgames.org if anyone wants to check it out. Uh, but anyway, I I do um, manage the website for it as well. Um, and when I'm doing that, I'm just really just editing Notepad plus plus and then uploading the files to the server and uh, you know, kind of just like I said, doing it the old school way. Um, when I have tried out some of those editors, like in WordPress. I found they're somewhat accessible, uh, you know, just kind of hit or miss depending on the editor and how it's implemented. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's different commands that you have to learn to, uh, you know, kind of insert a, insert a link, for example. A lot of those are not actually editing the raw HTML. You're just um, entering text and, you know, kind of like Microsoft Word, you're, um, you know, doing the formatting uh, and then it, it'll, you know, convert it into HTML, if that makes sense. Yeah. And Jason, do you have a into that? Or? I've uh, I, I found Visual Studio has gotten better and better, um, you know, every year that I've used it. Uh, and I know there are some folks at Microsoft uh, that uh, are you know blind that are actually working on Visual Studio, which is really cool. So they're constantly improving that IDE and uh, both when they when they make fixes there. What's nice is that um, the accessibility framework that they're improving. Uh, makes it work better for, uh, like Michael called out, NVDA, for JAWS, and for the, the low vision accessibility tools for things like magnification uh, and uh, Zoom text and these types of things. So um, yeah, uh, plus one to that. And then as Michael was saying, the, the simpler the tool, often the more accessible it is. So um, something like Notepad uh, or Notepad++, although um, you know raw and, and may not have all the bells and whistles uh, often because it's so simple, uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's going to work better with the, uh, with the AT and you can, you know, there's, there's so many, like you said, W3C schools, uh, so many great sites that teach the basic of coding. I'll never forget like writing my first web page. Uh, and I similarly got into it by writing a uh, Nintendo website. Uh, Nin dash gaming was our, was our site. And, uh, just, I remember like, um, just, I don't know, it was so cool to be like writing, you know, simple HTML tags and then for it, you know, to upload it with an FTP server uh, and to have it live was just, I don't know, so empowering uh, back in the day, uh, you know. You can, let's, you can yeah, let, let's circle a little back on this too. Um, when you guys started out, and for me, it's years and years ago, was the computer skills really important? And did you have any problems 
you know, going from not being a coder to becoming a coder? Were there skills that you were missing? Were there skills you really thought you should have had? What kind of things like that can you think of? For me, um, I started using a computer when I think, I think I was like seven years old. So this would have been 90, 1996, 97. So it was like the Windows 95 days. Um, uh, but, you know, I started using JAWS from that point on. So, um, you know, it, it, I had the skills. I think by the time I jumped into coding, I had them. But I will say that, yes, uh, you know, if you're a screen reader user, being really good at your screen reader is really, really important uh, because there's just so much going on with coding. Um, you know, even something like being able to listen to a screen reader really fast, which a lot of people can do with practice. Um, you know, I always get uh, the surprise, you know, uh, reactions whenever I show people how fast my screen reader talks. Um, and, you know, it's just practice. That's all it is. It's years and years of listening to, in my case, the eloquence voice, which is, you know, still <laughs> used for JAWS, <laughs> uh, still available. Thankfully, I hope it never goes away because I depend on it at this point. Um, but just when you're you know jumping around all different files, uh, trying to learn uh, the layout of code for like you know a complex system or complex website, um, you know being able to hear and process that information really quickly really uh, really helps you. Really makes you be more efficient. And you know for me now um, at Amazon, like I am the person that people come to to say like, hey, um, how does this part of the code what's work? What's going on here? Um, you know, do you know where where in the code we do this? Uh, you know, I, I am that person, uh, which is really empowering, really cool. Um, that's something that I would not be able to do if I wasn't a really, you know, power screen reader user. And Jason? I think that's great. And I think that and what, you know, Greg was mentioning uh, uh, on the, you know, the last chat was, was so true. Like the, the more comfortable you are, you know, with your competing environment, uh, the, the better it's going to be. Uh, and I, you know, when I came to Apple, um, you know, I had to learn, uh, you know, all the keyboard shortcuts and, and everything uh, for Mac OS X. And it was, uh, it, you know, it took some time and I, I didn't realize how comfortable I'd gotten in Windows and how, um, you know, how I was able to move so efficiently uh, with everything. And um, as I was doing some, you know, some light coding and things, I was so much slower and so much, you know, less efficient. So plus one to the uh, being really efficient with your, um, you know, with your assistive technology and your computing environment. And it's kind of like a, it's an upfront cost to do that. And like, you, it's not that, you know, uh, you uh, can't code if you're not proficient, but what I found is, um, you know, it's like you learn a new technique or a new trick and that gives you like a 10 X multiplier in terms of your efficiency. And I feel like whenever I do, peer programming or, or someone shows me this new, you know, new way to be more efficient. It just like permeates to all of my work. I'm like, oh, I can use that in like 10 different ways throughout my day. Uh, so so uh, I think that's great. Okay, um, I get to, get to add a little humble bragging for you guys now. So I wanna see, you know, Greg mentioned, you know, to become a coder, you kind of, you do have that point where you make this software and you're just like, wow, I did that. Right. And I can remember mine and mine goes back into the dark ages of black and white CRTs with the Commodore 64. And I wrote my first pawn game out of one of those magazines. And that was when I was sighted and I lost my sight years after that. But the point is, I remember that. And I was 13 at the time. I remember that to the day. Right. So in your you both of you have these, I'm sure, points that you can remember. So. Jason, what would be yours? Uh, I think of I think of two actually. Um, the first, uh, you know, for me was we we uh, me and my buddy uh, best friend worked on this Nintendo website and uh, uh, we worked on it for you know years and we got featured on I think the, I think the channel or the the segment was called G Four. It was like a a, a cable uh, you know gaming gaming channel and we were you know, on the screen. Uh, and that was amazing. Like, and I remember when we hit like our first million hits, uh, you know, that month. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the fact that uh, this little thing that we started, you know, just having fun, and then we, uh, you know, made better and better. It was just neat to see that we uh, got, got to that point. Uh, that was one. And then two, 
Um, I remember writing one of my first, um, you know, phone apps, uh, and uh, it was really a simple thing where it allowed you to, um, you know, to type in some text, and then it would have it converted uh, and read out with text to speech, uh, which you know I had used for accessibility. But when I was looking at the store, there was a lot of these, but they were like two, three dollar type apps, and I'm like, why are you charging for that? Like it's such a simple thing to do. So I just built one for free. Uh, and, and put it on the store. And again, just like the comments of people like, oh, thank you for like giving one for free and having, you know, thousands of people download <laughs> this little tool. Um, some were using it for fun, you know, but some were using it, you know, actually for, for real, uh, you know, scenarios, real experiences. Uh, and that's just so empowering. Uh, I've, I have some great friends that uh, work on accessibility apps and different things just in their free time. Uh, and it's very empowering to empower others, right, through our uh, through what we do. Okay. Mike? Yeah, so, I mean, I definitely have lots of these moments and it's definitely one of the reasons that that I keep doing this and that, that you know, that I wanted to pursue it as a career. Um, but what I'll talk about is uh, RS Games. So um, when I was a freshman in, uh, freshman in college, I um, had been playing, uh, you know, over time playing this Monopoly game on on, the, on Windows, it was written by this blind developer uh, named Jim Kitchens. He wrote a lot of games, uh, but they were all they weren't online games. You could you could play against the computer, or you could play against somebody who was in the same room. Uh, and, and you know, I thought uh, you know, wouldn't it be great to be able to play this online? So I actually reached out to him first and said, "Hey, like, can I work with you? And uh, you know, would you be willing to share your source code, and I can work with you on uh, making it." multiplayer online, you know, he wasn't super interested in that. So I decided, well, let's, let's go build our own. Um, so me and a couple of friends, uh, we, we built it. Uh, this was probably uh, all across the, you know, the fall of my freshman year. Uh, we built it, tested it. We, we had some people try it out. Um, and uh, I think it was December 20th, uh, 2009, right before Christmas, uh, you know, we, made it public and you know we weren't really sure what was going to happen but um it, it, we posted on twitter um you know got shared it basically blew up uh, it was really surprising we were not expecting uh, that whole week really it was just everyone was just raving about how great this online monopoly game for the blind was and uh everyone was playing everyone was sharing it we were watching how many people were online it was just really really cool um and and just so unexpected and, and just that feeling of, you know, we did this, we built this, and, you know, really it was the first kind of game of its kind for, you know, for blind people. Um, and, you know, we expanded it. It now has uh, almost 30 different games. You know, we have uh, everything from Uno, Blackjack, um, Apples to Apples, a bunch of dice games. Um, you know, we basically turned it into this whole platform. And, you know, now nowadays, now that, um, my friends and I, we started it both code full time, both at Amazon actually. Um, you know, we don't really have as much time as we used to, but um, you know, I'll never forget that those first days uh, when we first put out Monopoly and uh, yeah, the feedback that we got it was just really awesome. Cool. Um, so I know you guys work, uh, I know you both work with making web accessibility kind of a big thing for other companies. And I saw in one of your bios, and I know you'll probably both agree with what was said, but um, you try to make web pages more usable. And, and I call it the gold standard that's accessible and usable AU, right? S instead of working so much toward the, you know, special accessibility, you, you try to make them create web pages with the correct controls. What do you, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the web accessibility guidelines and how you go about helping people make web accessible web pages? Sure, I, I can go first. So the, uh, uh, one of my friends, Brett Humphrey and I, uh, Brett also has a visual impairment. Uh, we met at, at Microsoft uh, and, uh, you know, uh, outside of Microsoft, we were finding a lot of people asking these type of questions and um, so we, we do a little bit of consulting on the side and uh, very much to your point, um, you know, we, we one, uh, we do appreciate the accessibility standards, right? The WCAG and, and different accessibility standards are out there because uh, they do make our job easier and they're such a critical part of moving forward. 
Um, however, what we found is a lot of um, you know, a lot of companies seem to just be laser focused on being compliant, um, and we would find sites that met the letter of the law but weren't usable. Right? We would we would mm -hmm. use it with the screen reader, and it, it's like no, it doesn't work. Uh, it, it's not usable at all. Uh, and so what we do, um, you know, when we do our consulting is exactly what you talked about, which is um, we make sure that you know it's going to be compliant, but we focus on usability and how do we do that? Uh, you know, we, we ask the same kind of questions. What does your site do? What's important? Like, what are the flows? What are the experiences that you're trying to do? And we have them walk through their web page uh, and we have them explain it to us. Um, and, you know, when they get to something complicated, uh, whether that's like a purchasing experience or a, a, maybe a, a, an image map where like you hover over and things pop out, we really pause and we say, oh, explain that, like explain what's going on there. Uh, and we we have them walk through that experience step by step, um, and then we uh, work with them to make that experience uh, work for someone that's blind. Uh, and I I don't know that's my favorite part of that job is uh, teaching people how to make it usable. Uh, and and it's uh, it's kind of like you see the light bulb go off uh, where you you know you show them how to make things usable uh, and explaining how a screen reader works. Uh, and so I I love that part of. Uh, of my, you know, side gig uh, about making it usable. And Michael, uh, before you answer, you know, this is where HTML, whether you code the front end or not, this is where it really comes in handy knowledge-wise because you can help other people, right? I mean, um, you're in the background at Amazon, but you, I think, help out the front end, do you not? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I'm, I'm obviously working, like I guess, on the back end for our tool but you know uh, as somebody who has some knowledge and somebody who uses accessibility features definitely i i jump in whenever uh whenever i can to try to um, you know help people uh, and guide people in making their webpage more accessible and yeah really i totally totally agree with uh jason um you know you can follow the standard i, I mean i definitely think you can follow the standard and build something that's still not easy to use um you know uh, because usability is just so important, uh, you know, things like, you, you know, your heading structure, um, you know, your screen reader user, uh, one of the first things you'll do is try to navigate a page by heading so you can try to figure out, the, you know, the structure of the page, what's on the page, what are different sections. Uh, you know, the standard is not going to tell you what are the important things to put headings on. Uh, it's going to tell you that the, the headings have to follow a certain structure, um, you know, your heading level one uh, with your twos under your threes under those and so on. Uh, but where they actually go, that's that's a usability thing. Um, you know, making sure the, the focus is put in the right place, making sure that the right things are announced um, by a screen reader. Um, you know, all those things, um, usability goes into that. And um, honestly, like just being a, you know, a screen, a screen reader user, um, you know, we always say, oh, you know, you should, you should uh, someone who's, for example, not a screen reader user, I'll just go learn how to use it and test with a screen reader. But, uh, you know, having that perspective from someone who actually uses it on a daily basis, I think is, is really important. So I always try to, um, to offer that, even if it's not my, you know, primary role. So if you guys had, uh, let me just give an example. Uh, when I go to some web pages, the, the modern standard is, let's fit it all on one page so it works on a phone right um but if you had something like a document they're starting to compress the link uh, each chapter into a link and as a screen reader user that's very frustrating if i'm trying to search stuff so i'm wondering if you guys when you're you know talking to these people do you guys run into those weird uh problems where it's great for a sighted person it's accessible it's even usable but if you know a lot of your clients are going to be blind, is there advice you give them specifically, like have separate things, or, or am I just off base on that? Jason or Mike? I, I think it's a, it's a hard thing to navigate. Um, you know, I guess my advice that I would give is, you know, really index on a heading structure. Um, to make it easier to navigate over, you know, a large page, uh, it, it's a hard sell, um, you know, to get them to, to get folks to be like, oh, okay, no, we're going to split this into multiple smaller pages, or we're, we're not going to put as much on the page, especially at a big company like Amazon. It's it's really difficult to to sell that. So kind of we kind of have to work with um, 
what we have to work with in that case, I feel like. So uh, just suggesting, you know, any improvements that, that can be made to make uh, that page, you know, whether it be, like I said, headings or reordering things, um, you know, and, and so on. Yeah, we, we, we really push for, um, you know, one page that's going to work for, uh, you know, different, basically for everyone, as opposed to separate pages. Uh, what we have found is if people, you know, folks are like, oh, okay, we'll just create a separate page. Um, uh, although they do that, uh, it becomes very out of date, you know, the next day. Uh, and so these, you know, separate, separate, you know, uh, versions and separate navigation and things just long-term don't work out well, as opposed to, um, I think someone in the chat even said this, like, uh, designing for accessibility first, designing the menus to work. Um, and I think still to this day, even when we come across these like really um, complex, you know, concepts or things that people are trying to do, um, we, there's always a solution. Uh, there is always a solution uh, to make it both uh, usable uh, for people that have a visual impairment and those that, uh, that don't. Um, and you just have to really work through it. Uh, and and uh, we push for push for that as opposed to like, a separate experience. Uh, you mentioned um, working with machine learning. Um, do you yeah. see anything? Do you see? And I'm sure, uh, Michael, you also deal with this. Do you see uh, a lot of future in? I mean, being with like seeing AI. Do you see stuff that is coming in the machine learning field for accessibility that will be of great assistance, or just kind of put on your uh, Kurzweil hat and future gaze a little bit. Is that something that people need to be aware of? Something they need to dig into, machine learning type stuff. Uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll come at it from two perspectives. The first is just the the engineer in me. Uh, you know, like the computer scientist. Like I, uh, it's a field that uh, you know is continuing to grow. Machine, uh, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, and it will continue to grow. Uh, and I, uh, I felt like every product that I was working on, especially um, in the accessibility world, anytime we brought in a machine learning model, uh, it improved the experience just 10x, uh, as opposed to just traditional coding. Uh, and you know, now that I've been studying it and and you know, living it uh, for two years at Apple, uh, I'm convinced you know that uh, the application uh, with machine learning is is going to continue, and it's it's uh, it's definitely a, a big part of our future. Uh, and so if you're, uh, if you're into uh, technology, I would definitely say like, start, start taking some cool uh, intro courses to machine learning. Um, and what I'm really passionate about with machine learning today is um, models that we build, machine learning models. These are uh, just from like a, a really simplistic perspective. They, they um, you know, they're, they're trying to build an experience that works um, for everyone or like the average. Uh, and what I know is I'm not on that average. And so machine learning models don't tend to work great for me. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, something as simple as like trying to use uh, a keyboard on a phone, which has a machine learning model uh, built into it to make typing easier and faster, uh, wasn't built for me, right? The model uh, is built generally from people with sight. Uh, and so that model, um, the data that powers that model uh, kind of works well for uh, the average or whoever whoever uh, kind of made the data. And I'm really passionate about how do we make machine learning work great for each of us? How do we make it work uh, and be personal for each of us? Uh, it's it's uh, it's something that I'm working on at Apple uh, and some of my colleagues are really excited about. So I think today when you work on some technology, not all of it, um, that has machine learning uh, it's not going to work great uh, for those of us with visual impairments or, or some of us with disabilities. Uh, and I think we, uh, and there's a huge field about this, uh, about right. equality and, 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 you know, the biases of machine learning. Um, uh, and so we, we need to do a lot there. That's the second point of like, you know, there's a lot to, a lot to improve uh, uh, in machine learning uh, in this space, especially for accessibility. But yes, I'm, uh, I am really excited for it. There's going to be amazing technology like you said, seeing AI is a great example of it. Uh, you're going to find, you know, more and more of these uh, technologies. Uh, I think that are coming that are going to, um, I don't know, just innovate uh, and do cool stuff in the coming years. Michael, you got any comments on that? Yeah, um, 
Uh, so I think if, if you had asked me a year or two ago, I would have been a li little bit more cynical about it. But, um, you know, at, at this point, I, you know, I see it improving. You know, for example, we had we had Facebook's automated, automated alt text and then we have seeing AI and now we have uh, what's on the latest iOS. Like it's getting better. It's really, um, really improving. Um, you know, it's, um, sorry, lost my train of thought here. Um, yeah, I think, I think it does have um, a, a lot of potential, um, you know, like I said, we're seeing the improvements. And uh, oh, so to Jason's point about, you know, they're not being built for us, you know, just thinking of, what if we do build them for us? What if we do build them specifically for, uh, you know, accessibility, you know, for um, for use by uh, a blind or visually impaired person? Like, what can we do with it? I think, uh, you know, once we start to see more investment in, you know, accessibility specific uh, machine learning models, you know, I think we're going to see a lot over the next few years. Um, you know, a lot of new applications beyond just, you know, describing. Um, photos on Facebook or uh, something using a picture of the um, Okay. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, uh, I have a couple questions, but um, I want to circle back a little bit on designing web pages. We all know HTML, or if you don't, uh, HTML is the markup for the web, so it makes the buttons and everything. What languages do you guys see right now in the real world um, are languages that pair with web design so that you can make your your uh, coding do uh, or your web pages do what it needs to do? For instance, I just had to do some stuff with PHP. Um, <laughs> I coded in PHP 25 years ago. Now we're we're at the point where PHP's you know like. JavaScript and it's you know really got along, but I don't see it a lot out in the real world. Uh, we're only using it because we've been using it. So, what languages would you suggest to pair with HTML for those who are getting started? Michael, you want to start this one? Yeah, so the um, I'm not the most current probably, but React is really big now. So React is kind of like how would I describe it? Like a kind of hybrid of HTML and JavaScript, and it, it kind of lets you build these um, components. Um, so it's kind of an abstraction on top of HTML, I think would be the best way to describe it. Um, Angular, I think, is still pretty big. I, I think React kind of has taken over, is, is my understanding, um, but not 100% sure on that. So uh, JavaScript, of course, is still a big part of whatever language, whether you're using PHP, play HTML, React. JavaScript is what makes your your web page work. Um, you know the kind of business logic of your web page. Okay. Hey, I don't know if there's anything you can do, but you've got a lot of echo on your line. So just to let you know, um, Jason, what's your feeling on that one? Um, the, the this is probably like uh, secondhand knowledge. Now I didn't use a lot of CSS uh, when I started doing HTML. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, that is really critical to, to learn and powerful, um, you know, as you're coding, especially for accessibility and making sure you're, you know, uh, using that consistently. Uh, the, the larger your, your website and things, um, the more important using CSS will be uh, for the different assistive technologies. So straight up HTML is great and then plus CSS. And then, uh, as Michael was saying, uh, frameworks built on top, I think React is, is one that is great. Um, uh, I haven't used it, used it personally, but there are a lot, I think, that are popping up. Now, I still have more questions, but um, Leanne, do we want to, I don't know if any have popped up because I can't see it with the screen reader. Any questions that we want to pull from the crowd? Just go in once. We are looking at that right now, and I'm going to also ask um, if Jeff or Leslie is able to jump in as well. I know that we've all been sort of active in going through the chat. Yeah. Um, well, if there's nothing, uh, like, go ahead. I, let's see. There's one that says, is there a way to select, copy, paste parts of the, oh, sorry, <laughs> that doesn't have to do, 
conversation <laughs> taking place. Sorry. <laughs> Zoom is a pain. Uh, copying stuff from Zoom is hard. Uh, <laughs> low vision. Maybe we should have a class on that. Um, right. Well, I can jump in and just share that with that, just to let you all of you folks know at home. The, the chat window um, is not something that is, is necessarily saved. Um, we can try to do our best at looking at some of the resources that have been posted in if that's perhaps we know that with participants that once things start scrolling more you lose that access to the content so we will do our best to go back and try to archive some of these um, things and problem solve how we might best be able to get these back to all of you i think though that i can say ken it seems as though it, it the activeness of the chat, that people are sharing suggestions with each other, a question <laughs> posed, and then they're answering it. So unless Leslie, you or Jeff feel otherwise, I'm feeling we'll just, like we're in a good position. I, do, I, I, go I see a good Adrian. comment. There is a it, question about Braille displays as well, if you guys want to. Yeah, I was just about, I was about to hit Braille and then I was going to hit uh, something else. So, but do you have others? Leslie, you were saying something? Oh, there was a comment that PyScript is going to be the next big thing. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Python's big anyway, so, uh, but I understand. Um, okay, so yeah, let's get into the whole, I, I noticed uh, because uh, Jason, you're low vision, Michael, uh, you sound like you're one of the power voice users, kind of like me. I've kind of reverted to doing some Braille only because I, uh, I was talking to a coworker and he has a really interesting way to use Braille. But before I kind of say anything, do you guys have any comments on knowing Braille and using Braille for uh, web design, for formatting, things like that? Uh, yeah, so I do use Braille. I've been using Braille since I was really young. Um, I don't really use it much for coding uh, because, you know, kind of as I was talking about earlier, um, you know, I, I can listen to my screen reader really, really fast. Um, I can't read quite as fast, um, you know, so for coding, it's, it's easier to just listen. Um, but, you know, I do use it a lot. I have my Braille display in front of me right now. So, like, if I'm in a meeting, I need to take notes, you know, if I need to... Um, read um, read things in a meeting while folks are talking. Um, it's difficult to listen to a screen reader and somebody talking over at the same time. Uh, so things like that. Um, and of course, you know, uh, don't do it so much anymore, but um, I've always loved, you know, reading books in Braille um, when I have the chance. And Jason, do you use Braille at all being low vision or not? I do not, uh, I do not. Okay, then I'll, I'll make a little comment here and I'm gonna talk about this um, a little bit in the presentation on Thursday, but one way we have found, or I, I would give this to Michael Wapples, which will be also on the panel, but he uh, uses Braille with eight dot Braille while coding, because what it ends up doing is if you're using a 40 line display or 40 cell display and you're using eight dot Braille, you can actually view the screen as it would be for a sighted person with two with one pan because you've got 40 on the left and 40 on the right because a normal console screen or a normal editor is usually set up to 80 columns with 60 uh you know like 60 rows so if, if you want to check this out i'm going to be talking about it on thursday but it is kind of a neat way to use it it's it's like uncontracted braille and it's eight dot and um, it really helps when you're coding because you can uh, for instance if you're using python you can see the formatting and like uh, michael said formatting is really important for sighted users so you can actually see if you're going to submit something that's kind of ragged uh, just by panning down through it even if you're not a big braille reader um, it is great to see the formatting so that's just my comment on that um, um anything to add I, I will jump in real quick. There is a there is a good question here about any advice for middle school and high school students wanting to learn about coding. So yeah, that, that I mean we kind of hit on that early, but yeah, advice on I guess what level, Jason? Do you Jason or Michael? Do you have? Uh, Michael, why don't you go first? I'll, I'll come in after you. Yeah, I guess you know not. 
super current with what resources are available today. It seems like there is a whole lot more, you know, things like this coding symposium, uh, you know, which were not available, uh, you know, when I was in middle and high school. Uh, I imagine a lot of middle and high school have computer science classes, coding classes, coding clubs, you know, robotics clubs, uh, all those sorts of things um, that I imagine would be really great to get involved in. Uh, you know, of course, if you're really passionate and really interested, um, you can figure things out on your own online like I did. Um, but, you know, if not, there seems to be a whole lot more available now. I will mention that in the chat, this is Jeff from APH, um, that Kaylin uh, mentioned that the use of solo learn was mm -hmm. how they got started as far as an elementary school and they are in high school now. And they compared solo learn to like the Duolingo of coding. Right. There was, there was also a question about uh, from Sarah asking what programming language would be the most useful to learn? I, I know that's hard to quantify. <laughs> Depends on who you talk to. Jason, you, you wanna answer that one first? Sure. Um, uh, one other, I think I think y'all already plugged Code Jumper. Uh, I'll I'll get to the, the most useful in a second. But like, I am uh, I'm excited for Code Jumper as a as a toolkit uh, to to teach my kids coding. They're uh, five and seven now, and uh, when I got exposed to it, I was like, this is amazing. Uh, I'm hoping other uh, other tools. I, I I've done uh, Code.org uh, does yes. Hour of Code, uh, and I will be honest. When I started uh, doing it the the classes were not the most accessible i just jumped on their site to see i gave them some feedback uh when i used it uh, I, I you know they have a commitment to accessibility page i think they're improving it um, but i tend to go and uh you know do teach these to middle school students and it's uh the courses are really good um um you know for for uh, a lot of students but they they uh are continuing to improve the accessibility so i don't know how well the, uh, the the screen reading support is today. It wasn't great five years ago, but I know that they've been fixing issues. Um, so and then, to, oh, go ahead. yeah, go ahead, okay. please. Well, please. I was gonna stick a little bit in because um, since I work with a screen reader and uh, we don't have a third member, um, Make Code is also, I know Code Org is different than Make Code. Make Code by Microsoft, um, they're doing Blockly, Python and JavaScript and it's accessible. Oh, cool. Uh, so if you go to, if you find makecode.org uh, make and uh, Adafruit has it for some of the boards, but the point is to, it's a simulator like an Arduino, uh, like a, a, a board that you could code on. And it yeah. is, I would say 85, 90% accessible. And Microsoft is trying to make it more accessible. So they want as much input as possible, but I've been able to use it fine. Some people get stuck on it. So like I said, make code is a, uh, an amazing thing to try out. And like what was neat about it is my boss's son, uh, I forget how old he is, 13, um, did Blockly and he sent me his code in Blockly he shared yeah. it, you know, public, and I was able to convert it to Python, change it a bit, send it back, and he was able to convert it to Blockly and change it. So oh, I was working with cool. a sighted student and, you know, being able to cross, you know, work with That's that. Awesome. So That's something cool. to check Good out cool. for those who haven't had a chance to check out Make Code. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, HTML is, you know, is, is a great starting language. Uh, and then I think, you know, um, we were talking about languages that built on top of that, right? Um, Python on top is great. Um, you know, there's so many, um, there's so many great tools out there. I think one of the things that I've found with my kids uh, uh, that they're starting to do, they're doing more with Minecraft and Minecraft has concepts built into it uh, that are um, coding like, and again, it reminds me of Code Jumper where it's teaching you the basics of, you know, if else mm -hmm. statements and uh, you know, uh, different things. I think for, for Minecraft folks uh, that know things like Redstone, which is basically the material to do some of these coding concepts, uh, it's just so amazing to me to see like my oldest son starting to see, you know, that simple concept of like, okay, the Redstone connects, you know, to each other uh, and it can go through a gate, you know, and it can go left or right. Um, and, and these concepts, uh, you know, I think when we started coding, uh, it might've been really hard and the fact that they're introducing them in into games, uh, into make code, into code.org, and like integrating it in different ways is, is really exciting. So um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> well, hopefully someday they'll have a, a blind interface with that, but um, you know, low vision can do Minecraft, but uh, so far 
blind is kind of different. Yeah, so. the, 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 uh, I know that the uh, the folks over there uh, are working on like the improved text to speech. Like I have the text to speech on with Minecraft, and to your point, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, for completely blind yet. I know they're really working on it, and I've seen some really cool demos uh, of that. Uh, and so I'm excited for you know uh, the future for for you know experiencing that completely with. Uh, you know, with but the do you experience. do you both feel? Uh, I mean, what kind of school? I mean, uh, people used to say you have to have math, right? That's not really true when it comes to coding. What kind of skills do you guys think students should have before they just jump right into coding? Go ahead, Michael. Is that our um, Yeah, so, I mean, I think we kind of covered it earlier, but you know, the screen reader skills, I think, are super important if you're a screen reader user. Um, that's really the one thing I can think of, um, you know, before you dive in. Um, yeah, I, I would have said math is important um, for going into computer science, um, but apparently from what I've heard, there are uh, like, for example, a Bachelor of Arts of Computer Science rather than a Bachelor of Science, uh, which you wouldn't have to take as much math and you're not really using the math on a daily basis necessarily for coding. Um, yeah, so those, those are kind of my thoughts on that. One comment I would have is keyboarding skills are big. Oh, and yeah, of course, yeah. teaching, teaching young kids, I know they have small hands, one thing for TVIs and teachers to look for are the smaller Bluetooth keyboards and stuff. So, you know, I've seen kids in uh, mainstream schools go from third grade to sixth grade start, but they have little hands. So there are little keyboards that you could start them on even previous to, you know, some where they, cause what the, the <coughs> sorry, what the advice is, is make sure their hands can reach all the numbers and stuff while they're on the home run and then they're big enough but some kids never get hands that big i've got friends adults that are 40s uh that are they don't have hands that big so i think it's important to get tools that fit the kid instead of waiting for the kid to get big enough to fit his brain or her brain so yeah i think it's well said, well said Ken. i think uh, to your point also um, I, I'll speak on behalf of Brett, who's a great buddy of mine. You know, uh, he talked about not being great at math, uh, and be, and he's an incredible engineer, an incredible coding, you know, uh, computer engineer. And I think the traditional path uh, for 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 math and like that leads you to engineering, you know, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and you know, potentially computer science, computer engineering. Um, it's like a uh, like a leaky bucket. Like, oh, if you can't do math very well, or it's really hard. You probably can't be a coder. To your point, that is so not true. Uh, and I felt like I struggled with so many things in math just because things like graphing was so hard. I mean, the little lines were just, I was in tears, literally trying to see, you know, these little, uh, little lines on the page. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it's true that math is, you know, uh, based on, you know, logic and the concepts uh, definitely overlap. Um, but I do find there is such a great opportunity uh, that, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you find, if you think coding could be interesting uh, and you don't like math, um, don't feel like that, you know, that they're, you know, that, that they have to be the same, I think is kind of your point, Ken. Uh, yeah. There are amazing yeah. opportunities to be, uh, you know, an engineer and to work on uh, computers and technology. Uh, and as Greg was pointing out too, right? Like, um, you know, so, so uh, I love that point, Ken, that it, it, you don't have to well, be uh, an you know Einstein, or you don't have to be a math wizard to be a computer scientist. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. But I'm also somebody who, you know, who struggled through math. Um, you know, I did it. I kind of struggled through it and got through it. Um, you know, I think the more important skill is is logic and problem solving. Um, you know, you know, a lot of what I do as a coder is, you know, debugging, for example, diving deep into. The code, um, you know, stepping back from where this error occurred and trying to understand what's the, the cause, um, you know, so that logic and the problem solving, like those are some things that you really need to, um, you know, work on or, you know, do well at, um, I would say. But um, yeah, the math, maybe not as important, thankfully. 
Okay. Uh, does this go to one Leanne or? Well, actually you're, it's like we're on the same over. path, the mind path. We are actually four minutes over <laughs> from where we wanted to be. And so this Sorry. would be the time that we will go ahead and pause. Um, I'm going to turn, uh, actually look to Jeff as well, if there's Thanks, any guys. closing remarks or what we need to do to transition. Yes. So we, we're at the top of the hour and we're supposed to take a 10 minute break. So we're a little over, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to be opening up the teacher. We took our break and now it is time for Vanessa Herndon. Hi, thanks, Leanne. Let me go ahead and get this slideshow up and running and we can get started. Um, so welcome to Breakout with HTML. We're going to be navigating an escape room to learn a little bit about HTML, some HTML elements, and most importantly, about accessibility with HTML. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to do a quick poll to see what you guys are using, which will help me um, kind of think about some of the accessibility um, elements of HTML. So if you can go ahead and click uh, on magnifier, screen reader, or some combination of magnification and text to speech or screen reader, um, that would be great. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to, to maybe not a couple minutes, but another little minute to figure to, to put that in the um, poll. If you cannot access the poll, it is okay. You're welcome to use the chat and you could write M for magnifier, S for screen reader or MS if it's both. Or none, none works too. Okay, so it looks like we have a couple people who are using screen magnifiers. We've got uh, we've got about 22 people who have answered. We've got three using magnifiers, 13 using screen readers, and six using a combination of both. So we will certainly talk about how HTML affects your access uh, when using these um, assistive technologies. Okay, before we get started on the scavenger hunt, there are two things that I want us to have kind of a basic understanding of. Um, we'll touch on them briefly here, and then they'll kind of weave their way throughout the presentation. So no worries if, you know, this first time you hear it, you're not quite sure what, what it is yet, but I did want to introduce to you what HTML is and also what a web browser is. So, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. That's where you get HTML. Um, and it's one of the coding languages that's used to communicate with web browsers. It tells a web browser or um, like Firefox and Safari how a website should look and what should be displayed. So it's the language that we use to tell a web browser, hey, can you put this on the page so that they can look at YouTube in a certain way that I want them to. So the second part of that is your web browser, right? That's the thing that's thinking about your HTML and putting it on the page. Does anybody, I did mention two in the last slide, but does anybody have um, examples of web browsers? You can put it in the chat. Google Chrome. Google, I see Google, Google Chrome is, a, is a, a big popular one right now in the chat. Microsoft Edge, Firefox, Brava, Safari. There's a lot of web browsers, right? California Secure Browser, that must be popular right now if you're taking state testing. Um, so yeah, these web browsers, you might go into an address bar and type a website and when you type that website, it calls up the code and it says, okay, this is what it's supposed to look like. Let me show you youtube.com. Um, so all great examples. But sometimes we have an inaccessible experience when a web browser is displaying HTML code and we're trying to access it. Oops, 
I think that might be playing in a loop. So I will <laughs> change the slide. That done, done, done was about um, inaccessible web pages. Oh my goodness. Let's try this again. I'm going to share it again to stop that sound. We are not hearing your sound, so you have not shared your sound. Oh. If you want us to hear, uh, reshare with the little buttons in the bottom, which indicate sharing. Thank sound. you. I will do that. Um, well, let's see. So inaccessible websites are often inaccessible because they were coded poorly. Um, so we are going to learn about how to code. And I'm going to point out some important things that contribute to whether a website is accessible or not. So we are going to navigate an escape room. We'll have a few different riddles, which I'll use a screen reader to navigate. And we'll try and um, solve those riddles as we learn some things about code along the way. Um, so this escape room was coded in 2021 with some students during the APH and CSB Coding Summer Academy. And we'll take a look at what they made. Um, I'm going to use JAWS on my computer. So I'm going to go to my desktop and open JAWS. Let me escape the presentation. Okay. JAWS. So can you let me know if you see my screen and you can hear JAWS? Yes and yes. And awesome. if I'm going to, will it, will you keep it quiet for the chat room or do you need me to make the chat room quiet? Um, it's yeah. staying quiet. Would I just you... heard a couple things. It sounds like it's not, it's not saying chat. So I think you're good so far. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, so I got to my desktop by pressing and holding the Windows key and pressing D. I have a folder on here called Coding Presentation APH. I'm going to find it on my desktop by pressing C. 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 Ooh. C. 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 Okay, let's get back to the desktop. Windows D. C. C. I want to do it. C. C. Okay. Um. Windows D, folder view, list view, coding yeah. presentation, APH, 29 okay. of 31. I had to press Windows D a couple times to remind JAWS that I wanted to be on the desktop. So let's go ahead and open enter. up this folder by pressing enter. Coding and I have a few, uh, few um, files here. Let me zoom control in. Plus. Con control plus. You may not be able to see something zoomed in. When I zoom in, um, C -c control plus. Okay, so we have a few uh, files here, and you might notice that they are ending in .html. Let me show you. Two dot fin landing page dot .html. Three optional incorrect landing page dot .html. Eight simplified page one dot .html. Right. So I showed you a few that end in dot .html. Um, so I know that these are .html files. If I open this file, is there any guess what application it will open in? Because .doc or .docx will open in a Word document, right? That's the application. It'll open in Word or some other Word processor. But what might a .html? There we go. We've got a web browser. .html will open the default browser for the device. Exactly. Nice job. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and open this up and see what happens. Enter. Opening new window. Escape room dash Microsoft Edge. Escape room. Loading complete. Three headings and three links. Escape room heading level one. Up. How? Okay, before we get started, I heard Jaws say that there are three headings and three links. Um, maybe it was two headings and three links. So that's great. I know that JAWS is already pulling some of this HTML information. Kind of gives me a hint when I get to a web page that there will probably be some elements that I can interact with and that are accessible to my screen reader. So that is promising. Um, we opened it up with the web browser. My default apparently is Edge on this <laughs> laptop. So I opened up in uh, Edge. 
And it looks really simple right now. It's a white background with black text. Um, and this is because there's just HTML code on this page. All the fancy things that you see on a web page are usually added with JavaScript or CSS or something like that. So we're just going to focus on the basics, kind of the building blocks of a web page, because those need to be correct in order for it to be accessible. JavaScript and CSS also do have some uh, important things to consider when you're considering accessibility, but HTML is a huge player in accessibility. So let's see if we can answer this riddle. I'm going to go through um, the directions and then the puzzle. Use your screen reader's navigation commands to explore these pages. Find new things, solve the puzzles, and finally escape by completing the last task. Heading level two, puzzle one. You ready for the puzzle? I can move faster than a cheetah. I rush from left to right. I fill up spaces which are dry and run all through the day and night. What am I? What am I? Heading level three, puzzle one answers colon. Visited link water. Visited same page link sleep. Visited same page link a cat. Okay, so. Splitting sounds tip for job. have a. Jessica Hulk with Ray. From Eddie Mon Pauls. Um, and you can go ahead from and Rochelle. choose and from solve Emerald. this riddle with me. I see from that Eddie. there is a raised hand. There's some in the chat. We have a lot of people saying water. One person said a cat. I think I know who that might be. They really like cats, probably. Water, water, water. We've got almost everybody saying water. Okay, so let's go ahead and close this poll. Meeting I'm just gonna, before I choose water, I'm gonna make sure that I can navigate this with my JAWS commands to make sure that it, the headings are coded correctly and the links are coded correctly. So if I press H, right, I should be able to get through the headings. H. So let's go back up. The, uh, I think my JAWS cursor uh, was on the poll, so let me go back JAWS to... JAWS student escape room dash profile okay. one dash my wrapping the top. How to play colon heading level one. We've got a heading level one. Puzzle one heading level two. We've got a heading level two when I press H. Puzzle one answers colon heading level three. And we've got a heading level three when I press H. So that is awesome. We also have visited links, which I can press with the V, right? Let's see if that works. Visited link water. Visited same page link sleep. Visited same page link a cat. Pretty great. Okay, so it looks like it's coded correctly. Vis visited. At least from the web content. Let's go ahead and click on water and see if you guys got it right. Enter loading page. All Escape right. room. It looks like it. We made it to puzzle two. But let's go back. I want to show you a couple things. Puzzle. Going back. Loading page. Um, if I wanted to look at the code of this page. Um, a Windows command, so you don't have to be using JAWS or a magnifier or anything to use this command as long as you're on a Windows. From device. Zachary Morris. You will press Control. Control U. And it'll show you. Three links. Oh, links sim simplified. So when I'm looking at this, I see a lot of weird things. Let's listen to some of them. Water less slack. Link less I'm going to go back. I seven. Oh, sorry. Line, line wrap table with two one. So on the first line I have less doc type HTML greater. That's interesting. That didn't show up on my web page. Two less HTML lang equals quote end quote greater. I didn't see that on my web page, although it was in English. Three less body greater. Four five less title greater escape room less slash title greater from Caledon to everyone colon all. Notice if you can see in my tab, the tab is titled escape room for the page we were on previously. We've got a title and a six dot. seven less h one greater how to play colon less slash h one h one for heading. That's interesting. Okay, so this is all of the web structure. This is all of the things that I needed to code in order for the website to look like it did when I first opened it. This is all our code. We're gonna take a deeper dive into code in just a minute, but I did want to demonstrate that the structure, this, this code is what the web browser is reading, right? But the content is what it translates to, what we saw first, right? We didn't see doc type and HTML language and all this stuff. That's just for the browser. 
So, um, okay, so you might notice that there are some weird characters and ways of writing things, and that's called syntax, the way that we write things in HTML or in any uh, code. Actually, even in, in um, the English language, we have syntax, right? The way that things are supposed to be written. Um, let's go to the very top, and I want to talk about the first two elements on this code. Sepsi list thoughtful list three list two list doc type HTML greater. So we have doc type is HTML. So it's less exclamation point doc type space HTML greater than, and it tells the web browser that we are going to write an HTML. The second line two less HTML lag equals quote end quote greater is English. It tells the uh, web browser that we're going to type in English. I wonder what happens if we change that language. Do you guys want to see? Maybe we can go ahead and demonstrate. Let me get back to my file. The move to an item press meeting, JAWS coding presentation. So I found my file. Simpli simplified page one dot H. I have my .html file. I'm going to open it with um, context menu to navigate. Press up or down. I'm going to open it with um, from Amanda Bailey to Notepad because I don't want it to open in a web browser. I can't edit the code in a web browser. I have to edit it in a text editor. So Pick let's see what happens. Open so with open sub menu. With... And Firefox. Notepad and so, enter context menu to navigate. Press left or right arrow. Leaving menus. Items view multi select list box. Simplified page okay. one dot ht. So I'm going to go back to control plus control to HTML language equals English. And I'm going to change less HTML lang equals quote end quote greater. quote n s. E s is Spanish. So let's see what happens. Control S. Coding presentation APH to move to an item. Press the arrow. Enter. Opening new tab. Loading page from simplified page. Enter. Opening new tab. Loading page. Loading complete. Escape room. Microsoft Denka. Escape room. Three headings and three links. Link. Water. Same page link. Zlib. Same page link. A cut. From cut. So my screen reader is trying to pronounce these English words with a Spanish accent. Because I tagged this page as being in Spanish, my screen reader is also reading from the HTML code. So not only does your web browser read your HTML code, but screen readers are reading that code and they are deciding how to navigate and interact with things, but also how to pronounce it based on what language it's coded as. So that's pretty weird, right? and kind of cool that screen readers can do that. So if this was actually in Spanish, then my screen reader would be um, pronouncing Spanish words in Spanish, but right now it sounds a little funky. So you guys said the answer to this was water, and I'll go ahead and click that and go to puzzle two. Say link, water, enter, escape room, link, water, loading page, loading complete, heading level two, puzzle two, 10 headings and three links, heading level two, puzzle two, use your screen reader to find the find. Okay, so we have puzzle two. Uh, let's go ahead and read it. Heading level two, puzzle two. Use your screen reader to find all the letters with heading level four in the alphabet below. Then unscramble the letters into a word that is the final escape clue. Okay, so I have to find all the heading level fours, which using a screen reader is going to be pretty easy. We'll look at that in a minute. If I scroll, I'm gonna scroll for like just the visuals. I don't wanna give away too much yet. So I'm gonna announce what I'm seeing. I see on the left, I have the alphabet going. Each line has a different letter. So I have A, B, C, D, and A is bolded. Visually, this is showing up as a bolded letter because I've coded it as a heading level four. Um, and headings are only one of the many things that we find on a, on a web page. It's called an element, the things that we find on a web page. I wanna back up a little bit and talk about elements and I wanna talk about headings. So 
Let me go back to the presentation before we solve this riddle. Coding presence. Escape meeting JAWS HTML.pptx PowerPoint HTML.ppt. Okay. Elements in H. Elements in HTML. I'm going to close JAWS. JAWS student for edition with JAWS portion. dialog. And HTML. Start it when we um, go back to navigating the web and the uh, code. Um, so I will I will announce what is on the slide. So we have elements, pieces of a website on the web browser. They just look like parts of the web page, but they're written in a specific way called syntax, right? So can you guys think of any elements on a web page? What kinds of things might you expect to find on a website? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Image, links, lists, nice. Headers, nice. Yeah. Script. Yeah, the text of it, right? Um, yeah, you might find titles, you might find videos, you might find links, you might find edit boxes and all this stuff that you guys are listing in the chat too. So there's a bunch of different types of things we can find on a web page and of course we have to code them so when we write an element in code we'll take a look at what this looks like in our uh, escape room page but we have to give it a tag i see somebody in the chat was when i asked the question they were replying in tags such as less than script greater than or less than canvas greater than so that's what a tag looks like that's the the syntax or the special characters that we add to text in HTML code. So um, this kind of signals to the, the web browser that, hey, this is code and this is not something that should appear on the web. This is just for you, for your eyes only. So we're going to put a tag. Sometimes elements need a tag at the beginning and the end. So most tags will look like an open tag, which will be less than tag greater than and then the content so like this is my heading let's say that you're done with your heading then you have to close it so we do less than slash tag greater than so you, we just added that slash and we put that second tag on the end to indicate that we are totally done writing that heading or whatever that element is so for headings h1 will be the tag We'll have that at the beginning and the end of our headings. Uh, can anybody guess what a heading level two might be coded as? H2, nice. And then we have H3 and H4 through I think six is how far headings can go. So. Um, it corresponds with the heading level. So H for heading and then one for heading level one. Of course, you can do two, three, four, which we'll see in our code. Um, I know as a screen reader user, I could press H to go through all of the headings, but I could also press one to go through heading level ones, two, three, four to go through heading level fours. So that is helpful for, for navigation to make sure that I can navigate and, and kind of understand the out, outline. So we'll go ahead and take a look at our puzzle one more time. We've got puzzle two. Let's see what the code looks like. All right, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Okay, so We've got a lot going on in here. Let me open JAWS. JAWS. I'm, I'm not quite sure where my JAWS cursor is, so let me just to move to a simplified page two dot HTML and four more pages dash profile one table with two columns and eleven rows. All so we're going to get into this table that has our code in it. So we've got one 
less div id equals quote two quote greater less h2 greater puzzle two less slash h2 greater. So we've got um, at the beginning of this, we've got a, a, a link which we can ignore for now, but we heard less h2 greater puzzle two less slash h2 greater, right? So that we know puzzle two should be a heading level two. We also have puzzle two answers. Let me down arrow to it. Two less three, that four, less five, less six, less seven, eight, less H2 greater puzzle two answers, colon, less slash H2 greater. Which is coded as a heading level two. But I remember that the question was about heading level fours. And um, I did something here with the code. I coded each one either as a heading or as a paragraph because I could get it to be on um, a single line. There are different ways of doing that. So in the code, they're not on their own lines. You'll hear them kind of running together. But let's just take a sample of it before we go back to complete this puzzle. A set less six, less H4 greater M less slash H4 greater less P greater N less slash P greater space. Okay, so we heard that M was coded as a heading level four. So we can kind of keep that in our minds for when we go back to the web page. Um, that it'll be a heading level four uh, at M. It was greater, sorry, less than H4 greater M. And then we closed that, right, with the same tag, but we added a slash. So let's go back to the page two and solve this. Heading level, escape room, less heading level two, puzzle two. Okay, I'm going to back on uh, the puzzle number two. Use your screen reader to find all the letters with heading level four in the alphabet below. Okay, so we are going to press four to hear all of the letters. A heading level four. So A or A uh is how Joss wanted to say it, but A. E heading level four. K heading level four. M heading level four. O heading level four. R heading level four. T heading level four. W heading level four. Okay, so we've got all of those letters and our possible answers. Let me jump to that heading level two. I'm going to press two. Puzzle two answers colon heading level two. We are either going to have same page link workout. Workout. Visited link team. Teamwork. Same page link. Or work more. I tried to mute Jazz because it's actually giving you a, a um, clue because of the way that these links are coded. But why don't we go ahead and start the poll for this this next no alerts available. So we have A E K M O R T W. Go ahead and determine what you think it is. From summer the loop. From Cali from Donny from Ali. Okay, so I see some questions in the chat um, that uh, okay button. Maybe Leanne, you can address uh, about recording. Um, but I believe that this will be recorded and the presentation uh, slides are, will be available. Okay. From Leanne Grill to every meeting. So most people said teamwork. Let's go ahead and click teamwork. It's a visited link. I'll press V. 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 Oops, it looks like V. 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 Meeting control simplified page two dot ht. Jaws cursor was not on the page. Let's press V one more time. Wrapping the top visited link teamwork. Okay. And Enter loading page teamwork link loading complete heading level two puzzle three puzzle. Look at that. It took us to puzzle three. Let me zoom in. On Alert three, control control plus zoomed in. We have an image. From Adder Milky to. Um, we have uh, 
an image and how, how does anybody have any idea how images can be made accessible in HTML code? We've got from Kalanina to everyone, colon alt text. Nice, alt text. Let's go ahead and see what you mean by JAWS student edition with JAWS dialog. Simplified page 3.h. For a moment. So, alt text, short for alternative text is a description of images. So this must be embedded within the code for a screen reader to have access to these images. Um, otherwise, it's just going to say unknown image. And there are some things with uh, screen readers now that predict what's in the, what's in the image using some AI software. But uh, if, if a web page is coded correctly, it should already be labeled for you. So. I have on the screen, uh, what does it look like in code? And we'll take a look at what it looks like in my code. It looks a little bit different, but when I when you insert an image, you insert the image actually as a link because the image is not going to be in the file, in the HTML file, right? But you do have to say, hey, web browser, here's where you can find this picture. And so depending on where you're finding that picture, you can find that picture on your own computer. But, so on here, I have it as example marriage.png, which might be a file on my computer. So I've linked to it as image source equals marriage.png. There's more syntax to it that I'll, I'll explore later. But uh, when we look at my code, I actually linked to an image online. So my image source equals one big long link. So when you when you close that with a quote, you add before you close the whole link, you add alt text. So let's take a look. I have less than image img space src for source equals open quote marriage dot png close quote space alt for alt text equals open quote postcard drawing of bride and groom. Caption reads. Marriage lets you annoy one special person for the rest of your life. Close quote, greater than. And that's my whole image thing. That's the whole image link. I could just stop if I had bad code, not accessible code. I could just stop after marriage.png, close quote. But to be accessible, you do add that alt text. So let's take a look at what that is in our code. We'll go back to page four, open up JAWS. JAWS. Simplified page 3.html Microsoft Edge. Heading level 2, puzzle 3. You see a boat. Well, first let's read the, maybe let's read the uh, riddle. Take a look at the um, image. See what my screen reader says. And then we'll, we'll double check that my code here checks out before we take a look at the, the answers. So you see a boat filled with people. It is not sunk, but when you look again, you don't see a single person on the boat. Why? Hit colon, look at the picture below for a clue. Alert, zoom, colon, postcard drawing of a bride and groom. Caption reads, marriage lets you annoy one special person for the rest of your life graphic. Heading level two, puzzle three answers, colon. Okay, so let's look at my code. Control U, loading page, blank, loading. Table one, less two, less three, less four, use five, six, Y, hit seven. Okay, on the seventh line of my code, let's go ahead and see what, what I, how I coded this. Less M guess RC equals quote. So IMG. I, M, G, space, S, R, C equals quote. Link HTTPS colon slash slash www.liveabout.com slash THMB slash V up vote to F8. It's going to go on forever. That's the link to the the picture right and then i close it with a quote what's next alt equals quote postcard drawing of a bride and groom caption reads marriage lets you annoy one special person for the rest of your life quote greater 
which is exactly how it showed up on my web page, right? That description of the picture is exactly what I saw when I navigated the web page. So let's go back and see if we can answer this. All equals heading level two puzzle three answers colon. Okay, so why would you look back at the ship and not see a single person on it, even though it had a bunch of people? Go ahead and start the poll or start the poll after our Jaws announces these answers. Visit the same page link they jumped into the water all together just for the heck of it. Visit the same page link they were all marked by a giant whale. Visit the link they were all married. All right, let's go ahead and start the poll. You guys let me know what the answer is. Splitting sounds tip for Jaws. From summer. All right, we have ooh, a few different answers for this one. Remember the the um, hint in the picture was a married couple. Okay, we've got somebody put they jumped in in the chat, which okay button. Might be nice, right? On a nice sunny day. Um, so we've got five people sad. They jumped into the water all together just from to of it. Uh, two people said they were all marred by a giant whale. And 10 people said they were all married, which is the right answer because if you are married, you are not single. So that is why there would not be a single person. You got it. Okay, Meeting controls. Meeting controls. Simplified yeah. page three dot eight visited say visited link. They were all married. Go ahead and see. I think that this is the last page. So I think you might be getting a prize. Let's see. Enter loading page. They were all married. Link who escaped. Who escaped. Loading complete. One frame. One heading and three links. Who escaped. Heading level one. Congratulations. You got everything right. Hit play for your award. Link photo image of link. Rickroll left parent me. Share button. Men play button. Should we? Space. YouTube video player frame. YouTube video player. Zero oh one. Use left parent and right parent. Pause left parent. Okay. Play left pair. Got it. From Caden Johnson to everyone. Cole. I'm gonna Jaws close student Jaws. edition dash subscription. From Mac quit Jaws dialogue. Enter. Uh, you escaped. Nice dash Microsoft. Job. You got Rickrolled. You got all the way through it just to get Rickrolled. Okay. So we learned a couple things about syntax. We learned about headings. We learned about alt text. Um. So do we know a little bit, what does HTML have anything to do with accessibility? Go ahead and put it in the chat. What kind of thing? Oh, the whale could have married them. Somebody points out, that's true. After they jumped into the whale or got marred by them, maybe, maybe he felt bad and then caught them all married, so. Um, okay, Kaylin says everything. HTML, what does HTML have anything to do with accessibility? Somebody said everything. Um, alt tags for an image, using different tags to help screen readers identify items on the page easier. Alt text is also useful. Chester says everything. Um, HTML affects the whole web. Yeah, it has a lot to do with accessibility. It has even more to do with a lot of other things too. So it's important for people to code things accessibility because you just should, right? Um, let's think about it from like the business perspective, right? You, you might avoid discrimination or legal complaints or just having a bad reputation for being socially unresponsible and kind of rude, right? But there are other perks of coding things accessibly. So not only do you improve the usability and the experience for all 
for blind users, but you improve the experience for all users, including people who have maybe they're accessing on their mobile phone. If it's coded well in HTML on the web, it'll be coded well for your mobile phone. Um, you can usually, when you're coding for accessibility um, for blind users, that checks a lot of the accessibility needs for other kinds of disabilities. Um, so it's helpful for all people. In addition, when uh, websites are coded correctly with HTML and have the right tags, that's what web browsers use when they're doing searches. Web browsers, right, are reading the HTML. So uh, when you're doing a web search, your search engine is also reading HTML. So if it's not coded correctly in the HTML, it's not going to show up on the search engine, which could be bad for business. But if you get it coded correctly and it shows up, the search engine's able to read it, you're going to get more clicks, you're going to get more followers, everything's better, right? So um, I see that there is a question in the chat. We will have time for questions. I think we, we have about five minutes. Um, but I do want to say that there are some uh, resources for you if you want to learn more about HTML. HTML Dog is very accessible to screen readers, and I would definitely recommend that one. Um, Free Code Camp is also pretty accessible, so is codeacademy.com, and they have great content. Um, but also code.org and w3schools.com also have really great content for teaching and learning HTML. And um, they not every single page is, is totally easy to navigate, but it should be accessible to screen readers, at least with some mod modifications. So I really hope that you get excited about this and you want to learn more about HTML. Um, I believe that this is recorded and that the uh, slides will be available to you after the fact um, if you wanted to share this information with anybody. I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share now and we can open up for questions. And we just invite you all to enter any questions that you have into the chat window. We have um, Dane, you, you wanted to ask a question, go ahead and enter that in the chat. And Jennifer Hawkins had a question. Leanne, would you mind addressing that question about transcripts? Uh, I will be sure, uh, Leanne had to leave the room and I will be sure to um, find a way to reach out to Jennifer directly about the transcripts um, questions so that we can problem solve on our end in order to best meet her needs. Okay, wonderful. How do you increase click rates on websites? I'm not quite sure. I think it's a combination of things but in relation to HTML. If you are coded well, then right, then you're, you're, you're going to show up your um, search engine is going to be able to find and navigate your page and uh, you'll show up. So that'll help with clicks. What is your name? My name is Vanessa Herndon. I am a teacher at California School for the Blind. Um, I don't know what that additional... Um, can we turn off that additional screen? I don't know what's going on. You're asking to turn off an additional screen. Do you see, you see me? Okay, got it. There yeah, was like seeing you. Of me. <laughs> um, um, how do you make menu buttons accessible? That would be a great thing to learn in one of these HTML uh, curriculums, but buttons, it, actually, if you think about using a screen reader, your hotkeys, you're gonna already know so much about HTML because of the hotkeys that you use. So B for buttons, right, is your hotkey. And that's uh, how you might code a button. Okay. 
Any more questions in the chat? I think we have about one minute before. Uh, can you teach yourself coding? Yes. Um, so I would definitely try HTML dog um, for if you're getting started with HTML. Um, I think that that's a really easy way to start learning code. HTML um, is, is a nice way to start le learning code. Um, but all code, I want to say, is just text, right? And we often think, oh, like coding's not accessible, but coding is accessible because it's just text, right? Like you can write a sentence, you can use your Braille or you can use your uh, Braille note, you can use an iPad, you can use a computer, right? You can write a sentence. So if you can write a sentence using a keyboard, then you can type, or maybe using dictation, then you can write code. Um, it's not code that's inaccessible, it's the uh, user interface or what you're using to code into. So you can teach yourself to code and all code is accessible to people who are blind or visually impaired. How do you do coding with a refreshable braille device? You would just uh, code the same way. Um, so if you are typing your uh, code, you would type the same way using your refreshable braille device. And refreshable braille is super, super helpful if you are coding. I don't know if you guys were hearing all of those different symbols, um, but I make mistakes all the time. Debugging is a huge part of code and being able to go in and edit really quickly is going to be super helpful. Otherwise you're gonna be listening and listening and listening to be able to navigate your um, cursor to that spot where you need to change it is very, very beneficial. But yeah, you would use a refreshable Braille device to code the same way you would use a keyboard, but there is a benefit to having the Braille for editing. What software do we use to start learning HTML, Dreamweaver or Replit? I'm not sure about Dreamweaver or Replit, but for HTML, all you need is Notepad, which is preloaded on uh, Windows for, for um, Macs, I believe that there is a text editor. I forget the name of the text editor for window for Mac. But it looks like we are about two minutes over. Um, I really want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you all being here. I hope you had some fun. I know that I had fun. It was fun to see you guys chat in the in the um your messages in the chat um, and interact with you that way. So thank you guys. Um, I hope that you start coding soon. Hey, thank you very much, Vanessa. We should have now about an eight minute break or so. And our next session sessions will begin at the top of the hour. So hopefully everyone will be joining us from the other link and we'll see you all in about eight minutes. I think maybe we could stop the recording. Can I do that? And the recording has now started. So Adrian, we'll turn it back over to you. Hopefully we have everyone in here who is going to be presenting. Absolutely. If you're, um, if you're on our presentation team, go ahead and make sure your video is on um, and we will be able to focus in on you here in a minute. Uh, really exciting uh, presentations that we just had with um, Vanessa Herndon at the California School for the Blind. Shout out to CSB. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, talking about HTML and teaching and talking about the framework of how to learn HTML and directing that at students. Um, and shout out also to Chansey Fleet and Claire um, from the New York Public Library. You guys have an absolutely fantastic space available at webworkshop.club. Uh, sharing out your resources and the lessons that you have done uh, in HTML and CSS and JavaScript um, and making it accessible to everyone. And we truly appreciate this. Uh, this next session uh, is about student presentations, an opportunity for our students that have participated in uh, some of these HTML activities to share out uh, some of what they learned, their experiences with it. Um, and for the rest of you students participating to go ahead and um, 
and ask questions and, and talk about your experiences via the chat as well. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Vanessa, Chancy, and Claire. Um, and I'm sure that they're going to, uh, to get their students involved in talking about these experiences. Thank you all for doing this. Shout out to the students. You guys are the leaders that will be uh, presenting at future coding symposiums. Um, hey, Adrian, did you punt it to me? I did. You are there with some of our students at the California School for the Blind. Looking sharp, guys. Okay, awesome. Um, one second. And then we're here too, Claire and Chancy. I'm just in the process of making sure that all of the students that are attending from our uh, sessions are here. Um, I saw Dorlin here and I saw Amanda. Do we have some other additional folks that have popped in? Um, I see Dorlin. We have Arson from Grant High School also, Vanessa, that's on us from, uh, from Los Angeles. Welcome, Arson. Thank you. I was also looking for Sandy Rado has Leandro and Kevin joining, I believe. Okay. Um, Take a peek. All right. So Amanda's here and Dorlin's here. We're hoping to see Stephen and Sarah, but they're not here just yet. Um, so if Leanne and, and hosts Leslie, Keep an eye out for Stephen Max Faltz and Sarah Usterwich if they have a chance to join. Um, I'll be uh, on background kind of making sure that they're not asking me for the link on some other channel, but maybe should should we kick it off with uh, some quick share out since we were just talking about the HTML web workshops. Um, maybe uh, we'll, uh, we'll go first to, to Dorlin. Absolutely. Okay, so welcome Dorlin. Are you unmuted and everything? I think so. Hello. You are. Hey, it's so nice to reconnect. Indeed. Thanks for being here. So I just uh, wanted to just open it up. And I guess the first question I would have for you is what got you excited about the prospect of doing HTML and, and CSS? You know, um, I had never taken any, had no idea about either of those. And so when the opportunity came up, it seemed very interesting, especially with the pandemic going on and just that not being an opportunity that had come up before. But really, um, I wanted to know the, the language to use for when I was letting folks with inaccessible websites. Um, know what was going on, you know, instead of saying your stuff's broken, be able to be like, this is what's wrong with it and get that terminology. So that was initially what got me excited about it. Okay, awesome. So as you as you started to learn more about HTML and CSS, were there any things about the content or about your aptitudes and your pro learning process that surprised you? Um, yeah, you know, it was, uh, it was like a curtain had been pulled back from the web when I started learning it. Just everything started clicking, um, you know, the organization of it and the elements. But I think what really surprised me was how much I already knew just as a screen reader user, you know, knowing headings and buttons to navigate with the screen reader, all of a sudden it clicked into place knowing that these are actual elements that are being used in HTML and um, it, it just, it brought everything together. It was really cool. It, I think both made me a better screen reader user and being a screen reader user made it easier to understand some of the coding concepts. That's awesome. So I know I'm really happy that you had a positive experience, but we know it's not always all unicorns and rainbows and we hit roadblocks. So can you think of a time when you hit like a roadblock in your understanding or a barrier to access and what you were able to do to get past it? Um, sure. Well, you know, um, after taking the web development class with you and Chancy, I um, looked into free code camp and really enjoyed that. And it was mostly accessible, but then did find that I ran into a barrier because they wanted me to use code pen, which I did not find very accessible at the time, or I struggled to use in any case. Um, 
but realized kind of quickly that I can just go back to notepad on, you know, I've got the, the tools I need. I don't need to use one of these editors and was able to complete the projects on my own that way. Okay, awesome. Um, what are what are some of your next goals? Like now that you've got the fundamentals down, what are you hoping to do next? Uh, well, I'm currently in the process of learning a lot about web accessibility and taking some free classes on that through DEC University. Um, and, you know, hoping to possibly get some certifications in that uh, context. But I'm also, I volunteer and facilitate a group where we're learning Braille. And I'm actually building a website right now with the skills you taught me to have the resources that we're going over with that. And it's not ready to go live yet, but it's cool to have those, uh, those skills and be able to put this in a place and just to have the knowledge that I can do that is really awesome. That's awesome. Would you mind sharing a little bit more about DAC or DQ University and what, what it is that they offer to people that are blind or half low vision? Yeah, I would love to. I, they're great. Um, DEC University um, is, you know, they talk all, they have all sorts of courses that you can take on web accessibility, but if you have any disability, you can apply for a scholarship from them and then all their content is free to you. So it was a really simple process, super accessible online form. Um, I was able to apply and I have now a full scholarship to them and have been able to learn so much more about, um, you know, just the like the legal side of things, what sorts of standards there are in accessibility, but also how to put together an accessible website on maybe a little deeper basis, but it was all things that I started learning through your class and have been able to springboard into that on. Okay, fantastic. Um, Claire, do you have anything that I might've forgotten to ask Dorlin or anything that you're curious about? Sorry, can you see? Uh, no, I think those questions were <laughs> awesome. And Dorlin, your answers were great. Hi, how are you? Yay, I'm <laughs> great. This is so much fun. Thanks for having me here. I just, I love that coding is so accessible and that people are interested in getting involved. And Totally. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks again. This is really good to hear, especially since we did this. It's coming up on two years ago and it's really fun to see how you're still using it and pursuing even bigger goals. That's, that is the, that is the dream. That is always the hope. Yeah. So we also have Amanda Rada here who was involved in our open SCAD uh, workshop and just a quick word, word on what that is. And again, we built this workshop with a ton of hope uh, of, of support and help from Claire and other community partners. Um, open SCAD is a way to design 3D physical objects that can be 3D printed. And if you are blind or visually impaired, you probably don't have direct access to CAD software because on-screen sort of design building tools use 2D images that you can rotate. And so far we don't really have a 2D tactile graphics tablet, although we will soon, that lets us review these images in real time or compose them in real time. And so you have two choices if you're blind or visually impaired and you want to do 3D design or even 2D graphic design. You can do what I did during lockdown and you can collaborate with somebody who's sighted and uses traditional CAD programs like Illustrator. And in that collaboration process, you can ideate things on your own by using accessible drawing tools like sensational blackboards or the tactile drafting tablet. You can even use things like clay. So you can use analog tools, get your, get your ideas out and then work with a sighted person that's using CAD software and co-design. And that's a great choice. But if you want to be able to design independently, you've got to do it with code. And that's where Open SCAD or Open SCAD comes in. Open SCAD is a free open source cross-platform tool that we can use to write code that creates shapes and gives those shapes sizes and other property properties. We can move those shapes around. We can combine those shapes. We can scale them. We can translate them, which means moving them around in space on the X, Y, and Z axes. We can group them together and do things to whole groups. So duplicate a group or scale a group. 
We can even put in uh, letters or braille using incorporated fonts, and we can draw from a pre-existing libraries of shapes. And that lets us make all kinds of things from the very simple. So for example, if I were to make a cone and meld that cone with a circle of a sphere above it on the z-axis, I could make a little pawn chess piece. And we can get very complex. We can make enclosures for physical computing. We can make puzzles. We can make signature guides. We can make braille learning tools. Anything we can think of, we can design an open SCAD. And open SCAD, if you find HTML to be pretty friendly, you probably will find open SCAD friendly too. It's a great way to practice, to put into practice what you know about geometry and to really flex your spatial thinking skills. And I highly recommend it for anybody that is into making physical objects and doing design and wants a way to do it that's fully accessible. So Claire is gonna post again in the chat, um, the link to the Open SCAD curriculum that she developed. And it's my pleasure to welcome Amanda, who was in one of our remote cohorts for learning Open SCAD. Hi, Amanda. Hi, hi guys. Um, so thank you, Chansey. And that workshop was absolutely amazing. I had a great time um, and actually fell down the deep, dark rabbit hole of technology and learned more and more about SCAD um, than you guys were able to, you know, show us in a, what, two, two session workshop, three session <laughs> workshop, something like that. Um, and I teach math and computer science at the Washington State School for the Blind. So I was really interested in that uh, course and that program uh, to bring it back to my students. And I got to. And um, technology loving us all the way it does. I can't find any of their files because I really wanted to share some of the files that the kids made. But... Um, I did uh, come back to school and I worked with my uh, middle school and high schoolers using SCAD as the fun wrap up project to our geometry unit and learning translations um, in geometry because with SCAD you have to program in rotations and um, I'm sorry transformations so you have to program in that rotation and that reflection and um, they had a wonderful time uh, watching it come out very, very wrong most of the time <laughs> um, because we added that lovely element of 3D space as just that, gotta, gotta nudge them just that little bit harder. And I don't know if anybody has ever really played with trying to imagine things in 3D space on a computer, scattered to the winds because of COVID and virtual learning. <laughs> um, there was a lot of toilet paper rolls used, um, a couple of soda cans, a couple of green bean cans I saw. Uh, so I sent students on like a scavenger hunt around their house to find all of the basic shapes so that we could then model what does a 90 degree rotation on the X axis look like? <laughs> And uh, everyone successfully made some kind of small object, and I snuck into the school building and printed in 3D for everyone whatever model they had made. And it was just, um, the students absolutely loved it, and I have a group um, finishing up geometry right now, and they all just went... So last year's class got to do 3D printing. Do we get to do 3D printing? So now I think it's expected of me to cap off the transformations unit with some 3D printing. Um, and the, it's, it, it's just so, it, the, the kids were so excited to get to do it themselves. Um, I, did, I did provide sighted assistance when they were, trying to make their models to make sure that our rotations were correct. Um, because, you know, somebody tried to make a snowman and the head was not connected to the body. That has totally happened to me when I was learning to, yep. Would have been a very interesting model to print. I'm not sure what my printer would have done with that fiasco, but um, 
once they once everybody got the hang of the the 3D units and what that graph would look like, once they were able to get a concept of what the sizes would all be and how they would mesh and how to count up and over and back, um, the need for assistance was just lessened every day we did it. There was a little less the help needed, a little less help needed. Um, awesome. So it was it was amazing. And then I even used it with summer camp kids. Um, I had them for two weeks and we did a one day quick and dirty, give your team a logo in 3D printed material. And um, that was fun. We had a butterfly and a duck made. Oh, nice. Cause we had the butterflies and the fire, the fire breathing ducks as our team names for summer camp. So awesome. um, they made some semblance of those two items. So I guess I'd like to ask you if, you know, this can feel like a heavy lift for somebody that's never done it before and hopefully our curriculum can help. And, and by the way, it's not just our curriculum. If you do a Googling around for open SCAD, there's a lot of really cool, friendly resources for learning open SCAD with or without vision that are out there. But I guess I wanna ask you, what advice would you give teachers and students who are setting out to do their first open SCAD project? What should they watch out for? And like, what, um, what do you recommend to people that are thinking from a blind or low vision perspective when it comes to designing in 3D space? Um, have those basic shape tangibles near you, whether you go steal them from the preschool classroom or your little sibling, or whatever, have those basic shapes of a cube and a rectangular prism and a cone and a sphere, all of those basic 3D shapes there so that you can play stack kind of what you want your shape to look like. Um, it really helps to have that physical entity to manipulate. And yeah. I tried it without it on the first day and that class was very unhappy with me. So the second day is when we had the scavenger hunt for random items around the house. And that's such a good idea. And most basic shapes, we can find random items around the house. Like Your the kitchen is a great the, place. The toilet paper tube is a great, uh, a great hollow cylinder, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the kitchen is a great place to find all those items. And um, yeah, the kids made some really cool things. We had a very, very small Lego sized dagger made nice um we had of course an ice cream cone and a snowman we also had some people made and that were more like i don't know if anybody's ever seen the meeple where they're kind of blobby sized people yeah, yeah. like gingerbread cookie kind of people that one was a lot of fun to do because they tried to flatten it and it was made out of all spheres so they had to talk about connecting and not connecting and how do I delete part of my shape? And it was really cool. Yep. Uh, Donnie, it was a plastic flavored ice cream cone in red <laughs> print. So I don't know, what would red be? Cherry maybe? Cherry or strawberry. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So I wanna maybe be conscious of everybody's time and I think yep. we're gonna hand it over soon to Vanessa. But before we do that, I was wondering if we had time for one or two questions from the audience, either for Dorlin or for Amanda. Uh, it looks like uh, Jessica has her hand raised, so um, I have let you can unmute. Just by accident. Oh, no worries. Uh, <laughs> Okay then, um, I don't see any other hands raised. Was there anything in the chat? Um, I do see. see someone, their name got eaten on my screen. Uh, what kind of 3D printer? Um, cheapest and easiest to start. Cheapest is the Ender 5, but it is not the easiest because you have to put it together. So if you've got a real good engineering sp spirit, get an Ender. They're super cheap and you can use them to print their own upgrades. Uh, if you do not have an, a, an engineering spirit on that level, um, I really don't know. I personally have Ender at home, so. 
not fluent in what's the cheapest. Just not. There is a question, what is CSS? Uh, Doralyn, do you want to take that one? <laughs> sure. It stands for Cascading Style Sheets, and it's the, uh, the look of the website. Uh, they described it to me as uh, HTML being like the skeleton and the CSS being the skin of the website. So it's how everything looks, the colors and the fonts and... Um, they did a great job of teaching us that too. We use tactile graphics to understand different fonts and understand like the color wheel and complementary colors and stuff like that. So CSS is the look of the website. Right? <laughs> yep. Cool. The, I, my, my sound faded a bit. Was it Dorland's sound that faded or was it on my end? I think it was on your end. Oh, good. I'm so glad everybody else heard it. The, the bits I, I, I heard sounded like a great explanation. I am just now putting into the chat that you can visit our website at talkingbooks.nypl.org and go to the current newsletter heading and you can find out what's coming up. We have tactile graphics activities. We have HTML activities, open SCAD activities, Arduino activities, and basic technology education. Some of it is in person here in New York City, and a lot of it is available online and free and open to anyone. You can also email me, Chancey Fleet, C-H-A-N-C-E-Y, Fleet, F as in father, L-E-E-T, at nypl.org. And I wrote in the chat, our next activity will be an in-person gentle introduction to HTML and CSS concepts. For high school and college students, it'll be on Saturday, May 21st from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. So if you would like to join us, just email me, chanceyfleet at nypl.org. Any other questions for Dorlin or for Amanda? Going once, going twice. All right, I think we will turn over our time to Vanessa and it has been lovely spending time with all of you. Thanks, Chancy. Um, I'm here with a few students from CSB, but I believe we also have students from uh, Grant High School in Oakland. We have some students from BAAS in LA and one other high school in LA um, and some students from Oakland USD. I don't see all the panelists in my, like, my view. Um, so I, I have been told that you are present. So I will just kind of call you out when um, it's your time to share, but I thought we would start with CSB. Um, so we used the uh, lesson plans on the coding symposium website for HTML. On the symposium website under resources, there are others such as Python and Code Jumper and Code Quest um, and Quorum that are there and available for you to use um, by, on your own or with your students. Um, but we did the HTML one with students at CSB, also in Oakland Unified and LA Unified school districts. And um, in that, the students created their own website. So I'm gonna turn it over to the students to talk a little bit about their experience. Um, and um, if, uh, if you could spotlight my video, that would be great. If a host could spotlight my video. Awesome, wonderful. So we'll go ahead and get started. Tony, are you ready to share? Yes. Okay, I've got the mic next to you. I can, wait, wait. I can hear you, so you can just oh, okay. start talking when you're ready. Hello, my name is Tony and uh, my experience of HTML is that I've, uh, when I first read the, uh, what was it called, the Braille print, like, and tried to type stuff, it seemed like it was gibberish at first, but like when I just typed random stuff and tested it, it eventually worked. And uh, what I found out, like near the end of the lesson, is that uh, each pair of syntax has, uh, 
your opening and closing things for it. So like it make sure that it actually works and stuff. So uh, that's what I did. Awesome. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Were there any surprises? Um, not that I know of, except for that one time when, uh, uh, I forgot when it was, but like, uh, like the website wouldn't open. I forgot what, when it was. Oh yeah, we did have to do some debugging, but that's all part of the game, right? Yeah. All right, Melanie, are you ready to share? Yeah, sure. Um, so my experience was um, um, interesting for me because my main device is usually an iPad and not a computer. So it was good to get back into the feeling of using a computer again after so long. And the coding process, I said it was like um, interesting and um, fun to like use and just follow the directions. Um, though there were some times where I did go like a bit ahead and other times where it was like not wanting to cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> You hung in there. I saw your website. It turned out pretty cool. Yeah. All right, Natalia, is there anything you want to share about your experience? Yeah, sure. Um, my experience using HTML um, was experimental at first because um, usually I use simpler key commands than I was at, like when I started uh, making the website. And then um, also like um using like inserting an image was the hard part at first because um like it wasn't cooperating with how I wanted to put the image in and like um it wasn't cooperating correctly but then once I got some like some help then I got it to be working and then um then it got easier in the end and I liked how it turned out. Awesome. Do you guys think it was easier or harder than you thought it would be? Or just the same? Um, for me, I'd say like, um, it was difficult, but it was also fun at the same time because of its, well, slight difficulty. Okay, you liked the challenge. Yeah. Cool. Even though it's partially like asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I think we can turn it over to um, Oakland or LA, and then my students have some questions for the other kids who participated. So, sure. um, do you want help calling out other participants, Vanessa? That would be great. Thank you, Adrian. I see Arsen from Grant High School in LA. Arsen, if you would like to unmute, I'm going to add you to our spotlight or replace our spotlight for a moment. I'm going to add two for the minute. There you go, Arsen. You're unmuted. Oh, there you go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Glad you were here, buddy. Um, so I think, uh, and Vanessa, you're welcome to still stage this, but Arsen, would you like to talk a little bit about your experience when CSB came down to LA and we learned HTML together? Oh, man. I mean, it was really fun, but like, you know, at first when I got the, the Braille print, of like the the code in my mind I was thinking like this is like very overwhelming it's just like a whole bunch of stuff to like remember but um later on when like you know we I actually uh did it like put the thing in action kind of so to speak over time it kind of got a bit easier even though like I faced some challenges like in the middle one of them was like uh getting the image to be shown correctly because for some reason when we when i pasted the link of the image to the code and when exported it didn't really show the image it showed like the the link but like other than that it was like a pretty fun activity i would say only it was like you know as i said like a lot of stuff to remember and you have to really 
pay attention to, you know, like all the little details, you know, the punctuation, the capitalization and all that. Yeah, uh, you did an excellent job with it. Do you plan to take HTML any farther? Do you have any plans for what's next? I'll probably have HTML and coding as like a backup plan in the future because uh, I'm trying to pursue like a music career, but like, you know, God forbid, but if it fails, then I'll probably take coding as like my second option, maybe. I'm looking forward to seeing your website that, that promotes your music industry and career. Um, thank, sure. I mean, thank you, Arsene, for staying on, stay, stay on so you can participate with questions here in a minute. I see some of your Los Angeles counterparts, Kiara, Jose, Giselle, if you guys could turn on your video and Oakland Unified, uh, Leandro and Keith, if you guys could also prep and get your videos going, uh, we'll be able to spotlight you um, once you turn it on. Uh, Kiara and Giselle, wonderful to see you joining us from the Valley Academy of Arts and Sciences in Los Angeles. Very happy that you're here. Um, could you share a little bit about your experience with coding and HTML and how it went for you and what you thought about it? Um, yeah. Oh, we're having you guys are in the in the same room, so some of you might have to turn down your volumes. Let's see if. Uh... Yeah, we're good now. Oh, perfect. Okay, so. My experience with coding was pretty cool because I think before you guys came and like showed us, I think the only like shortcut I knew was copy and paste. So I definitely learned a lot of things and it was it was fun because like I even presented it to the whole class. It was just something, it's definitely gonna be something that I could do to take my mind off of things. But besides that, yeah, I had a lot of fun. I would, I didn't really struggle or anything with it, so. I think uh, I think that foundational computer skills is something that you guys really drove home that day and something we heard from our panelists and presenters earlier today that uh, coding builds upon the, the keystrokes and the ability to navigate a computer. And um, if uh, hearing you say that's something that you're you're striving to get better at is awesome, Giselle. Thank you. Uh, Giselle, I, I believe sitting right next to you are uh, Kiara and Jose. Would one of you like to share your experience? Yeah, Jose, I can't, with your masks on, I cannot tell if you're talking. You can unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go, Kiara. Okay. Yeah. Um, I really thought it was really fun. Um, I don't know much about technology, right? I'm a pretty, pretty bad at technology, I would say. I know enough to get me through life, like my phone, but... Using the computer made me think about how much I need to improve my typing skills. And especially with the HTML, um, it made me, made me think more about how I don't know the computer layout of the computer, of the laptop. So it was very eye-opening, but I thought it was really fun. I was able to talk about snazzy little animals with their snazzy little outfits and put in little pictures of them. It was very, I loved the whole entire thing. I was able to talk with everybody else. And it was nice to get to know all the people from CSB. It was, it was wonderful to be down there, Kiara. It's, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about your technology skills being low. Uh, I really appreciate you recognizing that the computer uh, is an important aspect to your future. Uh, that you can get away with your phone and iPads and whatnot quite a bit in school, but that you know that a computer will be um, a big part of your future. Uh, that being said, you you seem pretty slick with technology on your phone, and to hear yourself uh, qualify that uh, surprised me. But I think you're totally right. To beef up your computer skills will make you a will improve your future. Um, Jose, did you want to share something from from Vas? Jose is working on unmuting right now. All those keystrokes that you guys are going to be masters of in, in time. All right, Jose, we okay. can hear you. 
All right, cool. Um, so my experience with the whole coding was it was really fun because I always wanted to learn coding. It was something I've always wanted to do. So it was very interesting. And like once I saw the the opportunity, uh, I wanted to, I decided to take it. And like kind of like the other people said, at first when you see, when you see the, what you call it, when you see like the the code on the paper. You know, it can kind of like overwhelm you, but once you get the hang of it, it was just honestly, like, it was just simple. That for me, at, at least, it was really fun because I got to make my own website and like I got to design it. So it was just, it was really amazing. That's awesome, Jose. I would, uh, I, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, multiple of you guys have referenced that code on paper, mm -hmm. and that initially it's a little bit of a surprise with all those all those different details we're not used to seeing. Um, would you say that that helped you throughout the lesson to be able to reference that printed or embossed code throughout the lesson? Yeah, because I mean, uh, like if you don't, if you can't memorize it, just like by looking at it, by looking at it from like the first time you look at it, you know, it's always good to have it as like a reference. Or like if you forgot it, or if you aren't sure exactly how it's supposed to go, you can always reference back the paper and just like use it to your to your advantage. Absolutely. I think a uh, hint to everybody out there looking at the coding symposium activities, printing them in large print to meet your students' needs and or in Braille is going to be a big boon to the activity itself and your students' independence with it. Um, thank you, Los Angeles. Uh, stay on for a moment in case you have questions. Uh, I see Keith from Oakland. Uh, we've just added you to the spotlight, Keith. If you could unmute and uh, let us know about your experience with HTML and in programming. Keith, I think we're I think we're ready. You're unmuted, and go ahead and share. I my experience with it. I honestly had a whole lot of fun with it. I made like this little um fake virus thing or whatever it's not really gonna mess your phone up or anything like that <laughs> oh yeah that's pretty much my experience with it Not nothing like the california school for the blind showing up and helping you learn how to do fake virus spam emails huh <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you gotta take it take it to whatever level gets you interested right uh yeah. Fantastic. Do you think you will continue with any coding or HTML, Keith? I don't know. All right. Sometimes, maybe. Probably. Sure. Um, all right, Keith, thank you very much. I also see, um, well, I thought I saw. Is Leandro there with you? No, Leandro's at a different site. Okay, uh, I see Leandro's name. If Leandro, you want to unmute, um, we or sorry, if you want to turn on your your screen, we could pin you. If not, uh, Vanessa, I think we are at the end of the participants that we had invited here. I think you also, Vanessa, lost your our LA crew and some of our Oakland crew. Oh. Oh no, they're still here. They just. Okay. Uh, they're still here, so they'll be able to answer questions. Awesome. Was Leandro able to unmute and share? Um, not, not yet. Okay. Well, Leandro, why don't you go ahead and try doing that? We'll um, be asking some questions, and when you are able to unmute and and or turn on your video, we will ask some questions of you and your experience too. Um, but. We have some questions from this table for the other students who participated with coding. Um, Tony, do you want to go ahead and share your question? Sure. Go ahead. Did you learn anything else while exploring the possibilities of HTML? Okay. Did that get picked up on the mic? Yeah, we we heard it. Did we learn? Did anybody learn anything else along with HTML? Arson, Keith, Jose, Kiara, <clears throat> Mal, Leandro, take it away. Feel free to unmute. You don't. You don't need us to to call you out. Um, I can go. <laughs> um, 
like I said, I learned that I really need to improve my typing skills. Um, it's not that I'm terrible, but I, I'm not quick with typing. And I am very slow when it comes to those kinds of things. Um, I, I just, I learned a lot about coding because I only thought coding was math. So I only thought it was numbers, like what you see on TV. So I learned that it was like so different. Um, I learned that it was a little bit more easier than I expected. Not easier in the sense, but not as complicated as I thought it was going to be. Well said. Definitely don't have to be a, a math whiz to code. Uh, one thing I would like to add is uh, one important thing that I learned while doing HTML was like if you want images on your website to be you know accessible, like you never forget about the alt text when you're exporting an image. <laughs> Good call. Let's keep things accessible and usable across the board, right? For sure. All right. Vanessa, did you guys have more questions? We do. Um, Tony, did you learn anything while you were exploring HTML that you wanted to share? I want to turn your question back on to you in <laughs> case you had anything in mind. Oh, uh, not really. Not really. Well, I know that you do uh, like to explore coding a lot. So this was just one of the, the exercises to add to your experiences, right? But it was pretty different than other types of code, I think. Yeah, because other types, um, well, for me, in my opinion, they were kind of more complicated to do, uh, type in reference because they had all these special characters and uh, stuff like that. All right, so yeah, that might have been something you learned that HTML was more simple than you thought. Yeah, because all I had to do was like less than greater than just simple. Yeah. What about you, Melanie? Did you have a question for the, the group? Yeah, so do you guys do or don't like decoding outside of, you know, like school or just as a hobby? Awesome. Yeah. Does anybody code for fun? Don't see the microphones unmuting in mass. <laughs> or was this a first experience for most people? Uh, even though I am kind of a quote unquote tech savvy type of guy. <laughs> Is not really like my cup of tea because like, first of all, like my memory when it comes to like little details is like not that great. Plus like, uh, how do I put this? Um, yeah, I, I, sorry, I kind of forgot that word how to. like my memory not that great plus like even like if i remember like sometimes i might not notice that i skipped something mm -hmm. that was really important mm -hmm. so there might be like a 40 percent chance of me like messing up <laughs> that's a 60 percent chance of nailing it <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, I'd take those odds, Arson. I'd vote for you. Yeah. We heard from Greg Stilson, the, uh, you know, he's got a big fancy title, the head of global innovation at the American Printing House for the Blind. He was our keynote this morning and he said, you know what, coding, coding maybe isn't my jam either, but I learned it and it took him down a path um, of product management and working with technology and programmers to lead the development of technology and products and all, all things related to technology that the coding foundation really helped them with. And uh, I appreciate it when you guys know yourselves well enough to say, this is cool. Maybe maybe not 100% of what I'm, what I'm into, but it's cool space nonetheless, something worth pursuing. OK, 
Piara, I saw that you came on video. Did would you want to follow up to that question as well? Um, I kind of wanted to ask, what can they repeat the question? Sure. Can they repeat it? <laughs> uh, did you learn anything else while exploring the possibilities of html that was your question and then melanie's question i think is the one she's asking to be repeated yeah sure um so like do you or do you not um do coding as like a hobby or just for fun, for fun? i do not I like to do old people stuff for fun. <laughs> Knitting's the new rage, Kiara. Yeah, either that or hang out with my bird. Either one of those. Um, Nathalia, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, was there anything challenging, like easy or hard while experiencing HTML? What was challenging about it? Oh, Kiara is taking the microphone again. Keith and Jose, feel free to jump on as well. I off. feel like they don't want to participate. <laughs> hey. I'm calling them out right now. <laughs> um, the most challenging part was um, the picture part of it because I couldn't figure out how to properly put in a picture and the key, remembering the, the shortcuts and the commands was really challenging for me because I forgot. I would forget them. And I think you guys would constantly remind me, you can do this. And I was just making everything complicated for myself. So I, it was just the remembering what, to, what I can do for it and then trying to find a picture that would actually appear on my web page instead of just random things. How about in Oakland? Keith, did you want to share about any anything that was challenging or, or easy? Um, for me. Oh, hey, Jose. <laughs> okay, for, uh, for me, the thing I think that's what... <laughs> the thing for me that felt like the most challenging was there were different like um there were different like uh like options not options like different like settings in like like when you have to save the, the actual like like once you got the html down you have to save it to like your folders and save it like, a certain code to me that was like very like unusual because i've never i never knew you could do that and never knew that was like, an actual possibility so i mean that was like kind of new and like i learned like new things but you know in in at first you know it felt like I didn't know this was even a thing that you could do. A lot of control you can take over the computer, huh? Yeah. You're suddenly you're writing text and then suddenly you're forcing it to pop up in a web browser and then you're re-editing. Um, it's, it's only the beginning, sir. Yeah. Yeah. How exciting. Uh, Keith, that's how you came on. Can you share some of the challenges or experience with us as far as uh, what was hard, what was unexpected? It was kind of hard to find like a good video because oh, yeah, trademark protected. Yeah, trademark protected and stuff like that. Protected. We we did have some difficulty and struggle with getting the videos to populate that we linked from YouTube through via embed, huh? Yeah. Did you feel a couple of the other participants, Keith mentioned that they didn't feel like their computer skills were up to snuff uh, to code as well as they want to be able to? Uh, did you have that same feeling, or do you feel like you have a good computer skills foundation? Uh, I don't really know. Did you have keyboarding when you were in middle school? I took keyboard class, so it was pretty easy. Awesome. Awesome. Keep that, hey, having that foundation behind you and knowing how to touch type and be familiar with uh, multi-layered commands and uh, all of those modifier keys are really going to help you take on any coding language. We have a question from the chat. What platforms were the students using to explore and edit their websites? 
Vanessa, do you want to take that? You want me to? I can take that. So um, on the on the APH website uh, for this coding symposium under resources, there is um, the lesson plans, which will outline this in more detail, um, like the process behind it. But you don't need much to create and edit a website. We were using the Notepad um, application on uh, Windows computers. You can use a different text editor for Mac. I, I forget what it is right now. But you just use a text editor, you type in the HTML. Um, I printed out like a reference sheet so that they could look at it while they're typing out their own HTML and editing it and making it their own. Um, and then they save it as an HTML document. So once you save something as an HTML document, you can click on it and it opens in your default web browser. Any HTML file will open in a web browser. So they were able to make edits in Notepad and then open it in a web browser to see how it interacted with the web browser to populate as a web page. Fantastic. On the Mac, it is called Text Edit, also free with the operating system. Uh, and for those of you who are on uh, an iPad or a Chromebook as your primary device, there are also apps that are text editors that will work uh, in the same regard on iOS or Chrome, Chrome a Chromebook or Chrome, I suppose. Uh, Vanessa, we have a couple more minutes. Is there anything that the students wanted to share to wrap things up? I think Tony had his hand up. Tony, you want to share something? Yeah, can I say a comment? Yeah, you can say a comment. Um, actually, what I absolutely hate about uh, <laughs> Python is that you have to do indentations. And there's no way to actually keep track of how much of it you do, like this all tabs and spaces. Uh, that's why I like HTML better because you don't have to really do that. So I, mean, I do it like line format where I put a new line after each code. So that makes it easier to go back and find where you and, need to edit to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Tony, uh, Glenn Gordon, uh, one of the founding uh, code writers of the JAWS screen reader, was on yesterday. And one of our students was talking a little bit about Python, and he made a comment uh, that it was difficult to indent. And Glenn said, "Well, heck, then I think Jaws should work on that." So we're gonna we're gonna hold Freedom Scientific to working on figuring out if uh, they can make a way to get screen readers to acknowledge and and articulate when there's indentations that are pre present in code uh, in in our integrated development environments. Because it doesn't, it doesn't read it, so. Good. I, that's great input. This is the type of stuff that students, you all as advocates, teachers, as advocates, parents, as advocates, we need to share with our developers. Uh, I think just your comment today, which I will push over to Freedom Scientific as well, uh, piggybacked on top of the, the statement yesterday, will encourage the change that makes coding even more accessible. Um, I very encourage to hear from all of you. Okay, thank you. Of course. Uh, well, thank you everyone for participating. It was so nice to see your faces on here and hear about your experience with HTML. It was so fun to be able to work with you. So I'm happy we were able to connect and, and share our experiences together. Um, yeah. <laughs> so cool. Uh, thank you all students. Uh, great thing to add to your resumes. Uh, get them out. Thank you, Grant High School. Valley Academy of the Arts and Sciences. Thank you, Oakland Unified. Thank you, California School for the Blind. Uh, thank you to the New York Public Library. That was a wonderful student session um, from everybody that got involved. Uh, this is going to be the wrap up of today's symposium. Um, we are looking forward towards tomorrow um, and uh, starting off on, on Wednesday at 8.30 Pacific time, 11.30 Eastern time. Um, we'll do some opening announcements and a keynote from Andy Stefik. Uh, this is a university professor at UNLV who wrote the Quorum Coding Language. Um, we'll follow that with a panel uh, talking about coding concepts and Quorum. I think all of you here today are gonna be really interested in Quorum. Um, similar to HTML, it's a very accessible space and easy to Navigate Integrated Development Environment, that IDE where you write the code into. Um, it was designed with uh, blindness and screen readers in mind. And so join us tomorrow. 
uh, to learn more about coding, more about Quorum, um, and to hear another keynote and group of student presentations. Uh, I just see that Leanne posted.